I would like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to this afternoon meeting. Um, the committee has under consideration the estimates of the Ministry of Health for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2022. I would ask that we go around the table and have members introduce themselves for the record. My name is Layla Goodridge and I am the MLA for Fort McMurray Lac La Biche and the chair of this committee. We will begin starting to my right. Michaela Glasgow, MLA, Brooks Medicine Hat. Nathan Newdorf, MLA, Lethbridge East. Mark Smith, MLA, Drayton Valley Devon. Mickey Amory, MLA, Calgary Cross. Jackie Lovely, Camrose Constituency. Lori Sigurdsson, Edmonton Riverview. David Shepard, Edmonton City Centre. Heather Sweet, MLA, Edmonton Manning. And now we'll go to the members participating virtually. When I call your name, please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, Richard Godfrey. Richard Godfrey, MLA Calgary Fish Group. And um, Brad Rutherford. Hi, Brad Rutherford, MLA Ledoux Fulmont. Due to the current landscape we are all in, all ministry staff and the minister will be participating in the estimates debate virtually. I would ask if the minister calls upon officials to respond to any questions during the estimate consideration that they please introduce themselves before speaking. Um, is, do we have to get them? No, okay. Before we begin, I would like to note that in accordance with the recommendations from the Chief Medical Officer of Health's Health. Attendees at today's meeting are advised to leave the appropriate distance between themselves and other meeting participants. In addition, as indicated in February 25th, 2021 memo, memo from the Honourable Speaker Cooper, I would remind everyone of committee room protocols in line with health guidelines, which requires members to wear masks in committee rooms and while seated, except when speaking, at which time they may choose not to wear a face covering. And there's a few housekeeping items to address before we turn to the business at hand. Please note that the microphones are all operated by the Hansard staff. Committee proceedings are being live streamed on the internet and broadcast on Alberta Assembly TV. And the audio and video streaming transcripts of meeting can be accessed via the Legislative Assembly website. Those participating virtually are asked to turn on their camera while speaking and please mute their microphones when not speaking. To be placed on the speakers list, Virtual participants should email or send a message in the group chat to the committee clerk and members in the committee room are asked to please wave or otherwise signal to myself. I would ask that everyone please set your cell phones and any other devices to silent for the duration of this meeting. Honorable members, the standing orders set out the process for consideration of the main estimates. A total of six hours has been scheduled for consideration of the estimates for the Ministry of Health. For the record, I would note that the Standing Committee on Families and Communities has already completed three hours of debate in this respect. As we enter our fourth hour of debate, I will remind everyone that the speaking rotation for these meetings is provided under Standing Order 59.016, and we are now at the point in the rotation where speaking times are limited to a maximum of five minutes for both the member and the ministry. These speaking times may be combined for a maximum of 10 minutes. Please remember to advise the chair at the beginning of your rotation if you wish to combine your time with the ministers. One final note. Please remember that, while, that all discussions must flow through the chair at all times, regardless or, as to whether or not speaking times are combined. If members have any questions regarding speaking times or the rotation, please feel free to send an email message to the committee clerk about the process. With the concurrence of the committee, I will call a five minute break near the midpoint of the meeting. However, the three hour clock will continue to run. Does anyone have, is there anyone that's opposed to having a break? Hearing none, we will coordinate with the other committee so as to not be on break at the same time. Uh, when we adjourned this morning, we were about two minutes into the exchange between Member Newdorf and the Minister. I will now invite uh, MLA Nathan Newdorf or another member from the Government Caucus to complete the remaining time in this rotation. Uh, Nathan, uh, Mr. Newdorf, sorry, you have eight minutes. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, I had begun a little bit of my uh, preface for the question 
uh, about the Alberta Health Services uh, review that was performed and some of the recommendations that were provided for this budget. So my first question on that topic is, would you be able to outline what some of these recommendations were and inform us on whether you proceeded with any of these recommendations uh, in this budget? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, uh, and to the member for the question. So maybe I'll, I'll highlight the, um, uh, the the portion of recommendations that uh, we permitted AHS to proceed with during the pandemic. Um, and uh, just a reminder that uh, as a result of the pandemic, we we had, uh, if you remember, the, uh, the the performance review was due by the end of 2019. Uh, we received it and made it public, I think, in January or, or February of uh, 2020. Uh, within a, a direction to AHS to be able to come back by May 13th of 2020 with their implement, um, implementation plan. They asked for uh, some time uh, as a result of responding to the pandemic to, uh, to, uh, to table that with us. And we uh, ended up receiving it, uh, I think in September, we announced it in, in October. And we ended up proceeding with a portion of those, uh, such as the, the virtual care options, and the, uh, con uh, the, the integration of the uh, dispatch operations for EMS into our hospital system, continued uh, integration, uh, which would, would, uh, allows us to achieve improved patient outcomes in, uh, in addition to those efficiencies. Um, requests for proposals to support the, uh, the contracting out of the remainder of laundry um, uh, in, in the, the province, as well as the remainder of community lab services uh, to uh, help AHS to focus on its core services to Albertans and uh, the eliminating of 100 management positions in AHS as well. Um, we directed AHS to take a, a long-term and gradual approach to implementing the, uh, the performance review and to uh, put patient care above all else, especially and in particular because of the, uh, the response to the pandemic. Uh, and so AHS has taken a staged approach to implementing some of the, the other performance review initiatives being mindful of the, the current response to the pandemic and uh, the capacity uh, for them to, uh, to change during the, uh, the pandemic. Um, AHS uh, was directed then to proceed with just the, those portion uh, or that, the portion of the, the, uh, of the actions that are identified in the implementation plan and with no job losses for, for nurses or other front, frontline clinical staff. Minister Sandro, uh, Mr. Newdor. Thank you, Minister. Um, and thank you for outlining those, uh, those recommendations that you proceeded with. At this time, do you have any uh, uh, ability to share with us what the expected cost savings for Albertans would be with those recommendations being implemented? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Madam Chair, and, and to the member. So the, the approved actions, uh, the ones that we approved and permitted them to proceed with, uh, would result in approximately 600 million in annualized uh, savings uh, upon full implementation, uh, which then would be reinvested back into the, the healthcare system. And for some of these items, full implementation um, is, is really going to take for, for all these items, full implementation could take up to 10 years for, um, for all of them. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Newdorf? Thank you very much for that. Uh, I have one final question for you, Minister. <clears throat> um, Many Albertans are concerned that this government is trying to privatize healthcare. I know we've, we've touched on that word and that meaning before. Uh, outcome three on page 54 of the business plan includes the statement that you, have, that you want to see health inequities among population groups reduced. And many feel the only way to achieve this is to keep healthcare public. So if you don't mind, can you explain a little bit more uh, about the use of private surgical facilities to help reduce surgical wait times how this is not actually privatized healthcare, and how does this achieve the desired outcomes as outlined in the business plan? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to the member. And they're not, not private surgical facilities, and it's not privatized healthcare, quite frankly, because these surgeries are 100% publicly funded. Now, it is true, like uh, primary care, like our family physicians operating in the community, like uh, the 80% of our continuing care beds, like um, much of our um, uh, our community uh, lab system in north, uh, the north part of the province, north of Red Deer, those are all done by independent uh, providers. Um, and, and so no different than this. The, they are independently owned. They are independently operated, um, integrated into the, uh, the system and managed by AHS under contract. 
Um, and, and they would be providing, um, right now, we would anticipate in a given year about 290,000 surgeries uh, normally performed in, in the next year. So we're going to be adding another 55,000 additional sur uh, surgeries, including both in AHS operating rooms as well as the operating rooms of the CSFs. Um, and to uh, um, and so to help to uh, to achieve this, the the, the CSFs um, are, are an int uh, integral part of being able to increase this volume, um, as well as the the hundred million dollars I mentioned this morning uh, to to invest in the AHS operating rooms for them to expand the uh, the volumes that we can do in AHS uh, operating rooms as well. Thank you, Minister, and Mr. Newdorf. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Uh, one one final question for you, Minister. Um, given, given this understanding of independent providers within the public sector healthcare, could you elaborate possibly a little bit further on how, how integrated the private system is within our public healthcare in terms of equipment, beds, bandages, supplies, PPE, even our drugs, and, and many, many of our doctors operate as private businesses. Uh, can you just elaborate on how those systems are integrated and how some of those false concepts can be uh, uh, unfortunately used to uh, scare the general public. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, you know, it is an opportunity sometimes for our opponents to, uh, to, um, to cherry-pick and to criticize and to sometimes misrepresent the situation to their own uh, political ends. But the fact is, is that, um, uh, that much of the system is provided not just by HS but by independent providers, and whether it's uh, home care, um, that uh, some of it is contracted uh, out and some of it is provided by HS, continuing care, lab services. Um, the 11,000 physicians that we have in the province, virtually all of them are independent vendors providing patient services on behalf of government. They're not, uh, uh, they, they are independent businesses, most of them incorporated as a professional corporation. And uh, the Charter Surgical Facilities, which by the way, we've, we've had in, in Alberta, there's 43 of them already in the province, um, we've had these independently run surgical facilities since the 90s here in Alberta uh, to be able to provide the, the publicly funded surgeries to, to Albertans uh, integrated under um, uh, with AHS uh, under contract because the contract is with AHS. So AHS then can manage them, contract out with them. The College of Physicians and Surgeons um, is also included in their accreditation, whether it's the, the MDR or uh, sorry, the uh, the um, uh, what's the proper word? Medical device reprocessing. They, they call it. They call it something other than MDR. They're in a chartered surgical facility. But um, you know, from the uh, as well as the other standards that are required is managed by the the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Thank you, Minister. And with that, we move to our first um, in this round with the official opposition, um, Mr. Shepherd. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure to be back this afternoon and continue with the estimates questions. Uh, I hope for this first question I'm going to take a bit of time to frame my question, and I hope that uh, yourself and the other members will allow me the same latitude that's been granted to other members to do so. So in regards to outcome two in the business plan, a safe, person-centered, quality health system that provides the most effective care for each tax dollar spent. I note this year, uh, through you to the Minister, Madam Chair, that the business plan is quite a bit shorter, has quite a bit less content. Now, the Minister is operating a $23 billion enterprise at the center of coordinating significant action in the midst of the greatest crisis that it's likely ever faced while also pushing forward with potentially the most ambitious transformation of huge sections of its entire structure, systems, and workforce. And yet the business plan that he puts forward in the midst of this work, laying out his vision, his objectives, his performance metrics for that work is two pages, 763 words. Last year's business plan, Madam Chair, eight pages, 2,084 words words. Indeed, we've gone from 22 performance metrics in last year's business plan to only three in this one. That is a massive reduction in measurement, transparency, and accountability at a time when the minister's work has in fact become even more important, more complex, and more ambitious. He's removed measures regarding health outcomes for First Nations people in Alberta. He's removed every measure regarding addictions and mental health. And of course, this follows on changes to the Health Quality Council of Alberta through legislation. 
undermining their independence and in tracking the quality and responsiveness of the healthcare system in Alberta. And of the three, the three actual metrics that the minister is presenting, two are focused solely on his own marquee political objectives, reducing spending and improving surgical wait times. Not that those two things are not in themselves worthy of pursuit, but that is all he is choosing to measure, almost two of the three. So it almost seems like the minister is trying to provide, providing even less information here. Why, in the midst of all this, is the minister providing less information, less objective criteria, less performance metrics for Albertans and indeed us as the official opposition on behalf of Albertans to be able to track his work and hold him to account? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, first, I, I say that the uh, the directions regarding the templates for the uh, the business plan is a direction from Treasury Board. I'd also say this that uh, the budget is 198 pages, as well. I'm making myself available for six hours, along with officials from the ministry, to be able to answer questions from the member, as well as other members of the committee. Um, throughout, uh, if if we also want transparency. Uh, during the, uh, the response to, to the pandemic, um, strangely, there were many weeks uh, throughout the, the spring um, where we received, or I received zero questions from the, uh, the health critic. I think I received more questions from uh, other members of the NDP caucus in question period about the response to the pandemic than I ever received from the health critic, which is quite strange. Um, as well, uh, Madam Chair, I'm just going to be able to answer a couple of questions that arose from this morning. The, uh, the member asked about uh, good faith uh, claims that are paid and what the savings might be from this uh, proposal that was included in the, uh, the new physician funding framework. So um, I guess we would anticipate to be about uh, $1.5 million. Um, in 1920, the total amount paid under good faith claims was $1.547 million. Um, also, there was a, another member who had questions about midwives. Um, I understand uh, the question was about where the uh, additional courses of care were going to be uh, throughout the province. Uh, we now have an answer from AHS on where those additional funded courses of care are going to be. At this time, the, 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 the expectation would be that the, the services, those additional courses of care would be provided in all five of the AHS zones, North, Central, South, Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, but uh, where in each of these uh, five zones has not yet uh, been um, determined there is no specific distribution for courses of care, uh, but AHS advises us that they are focused on growing midwifery services in rural uh, areas and, um, and across targeted populations. So un unfortunately, uh, more information would have to be wait for, for AHS to continue to do this work, uh, but happy to be able to provide that answer to uh, the mem member for Edmonton for Nora. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Minister Shandro, and on to Mr. Shepherd. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to the Minister. If he has further information to uh, table regarding previous answers, we'd be happy to receive that in writing, but I would appreciate it if we could focus on the questions in front of us now as we proceed now. Um, uh, moving Shepherd, on to my next question. Uh, well, well, you might not always like the answers that are being given by the Minister. Those are the answers that he is giving, and we have to afford a certain amount of latitude to both the minister and to the questions being asked. Thank you, Madam Chair. And indeed, the minister can answer as he wishes. And it's my hope that I can respond to that as I wish as well. So thank you, Madam Chair. I'll move on to my next question regarding the business plan. So key objective 1.6 in the business plan last year talked about ensuring Albertans are able to navigate the complaints process so that the voice of patients and caregivers leads to real improvement. That's been removed. This year, there is no mention of improving the complaints processes for Albertans. Minister, does this remain a priority for you? Minister Shandro. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, um, improving the uh, complaints uh, process for patients is uh, still work that we're doing. We're very happy to have um, uh, had the assistance of the Health Quality Council of Alberta to be able to provide us with recommendations on how we can work with our colleges. We also had a white paper that went out to our colleges. They were very helpful, all 30 of them, to be able to give us feedback on the questions that um, the ministry had for, for them on how we uh, might be able to continue to improve the uh, patient complaints process. 
Um, and uh, to make it easier for a patient to understand, you know, a lot of times a, a patient may not know the difference between, for example, uh, the two different colleges for, for nursing, the uh, CARNA and uh, the LPN college. And to also um, provide us, um, we're also looking at um, the ways in which we can improve uh, the, the complaints resolution process that uh, occurs within AHS. So that will continue to be work that we, uh, we work on. Thank you, Mr. Sandro. Mr. Thank Chandra. you, Madam Chair. So, Minister, uh, in that discussion paper, indeed, you considered some fairly drastic changes to some of the current systems, such as consolidating registration and complaints processes for all professions under the control of Alberta Health, um, options two and uh, on page six and option three on page seven of that discussion paper. Um, that, I'm sure, would come with some not insignificant additional costs for your department. Are you indeed still considering pursuing those and if so have you included any amounts in your budget to account for those additional operating expenses Mr. Chandra. Mr. Chandra. Thank you Madam Chair um, first of all the the white paper was a way for us to provide a framework for discussion with the uh, the colleges to be able to get their feedback so it did include many different options that we uh, might be able to get their feedback on before we were able to um, make any decisions. So no decisions have been made um, about how the uh, the patient complaint uh, process might be improved. And uh, there were there was a, a wide range of uh, opportunities for have of us to have these discussions with uh, the uh, the colleges as well as um, those who are otherwise involved in um, in patient safety, like the Health Quality Council, the many different groups that the uh, Health Quality Council engages with. And uh, so uh, anything that was included in the white paper was merely for us to be able to provide a framework of discussion with the colleges and uh, was not to prejudice uh, any of what we might be considering. Thank you, Minister Chandro. Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. So then in regards to the implementing these changes with the intent, I guess, of improving the health care system as noted in your business plan, possibly with an eye towards cost savings, uh, when, uh, when might Albertans expect to hear from you as to your intent on what changes you might make? Is that anticipated within this next budget year or is that something you're anticipating will be pushed further down the road? One second. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we, we have no decisions to, to be able to announce today, Madam Chair, about the, um, the ways that we're working with our colleges to improve the patient complaints process. Thank you. And with that, we're back to the Government Caucus, and I believe uh, MLA Lovely. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Minister, this past weekend, I had the pleasure of meeting a couple who have recently moved to Camrose. It's a husband-wife team who are both practicing doctors. And they got off the plane and drove around the province, did a little tour, drove into Camrose and fell in love with the community and have decided to start practicing there. So I'm really excited about that. And as we were chatting, the husband told me that his focus of practice will be on seniors. And of, of course, you know, in my community of Camrose, we have double the population of seniors as compared to the rest of the province. So I'm really excited about what this couple is going to bring to our community and um, their passion for seniors, that same passion that I share. Which leads me to my question. Um, seniors are a valued part of our communities and ensuring that they have access to quality care is crucial. Whether they're in continuing care homes or utilize in-home services, it is our duty to provide seniors with top-notch service and best outcomes possible. Continuing care homes are essential in the delivery of this care and help give peace of mind to loved ones. I'm pleased to see on page 112 of your estimates, line item 2.2, Continuing care has received an increase of $146 million. Uh, so my question, Minister, is I was wondering if you could explain the rationale for this increase and whether some of this funding will be going towards additional continuing care spaces. Thank you, MLA Lovely. Lovely. Mr. Chandra. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the member for the question. Um, so government is, is committed to in ensuring that uh, those who are, are aging those who are vulnerable uh, have the the care that they need in the, the communities that they, they call home. And, and just a reminder too that continuing care is a spectrum. It, uh, it ranges, uh, in my mind, uh, from, from home care on one, one side all the way to long-term care, the most intensive type of care that we, we get in the community. 
uh, on the other side. And it does include uh, supportive living, designated supportive living or licensed supportive living uh, and everything uh, in between on that spectrum. Now, Budget 21 uh, does include over $3.5 billion in, in operating funding for um, all three of, of continuing care, community care and home care programs. That is an increase of 6% or $200 million, uh, from the, the previous year. And uh, this is going to be supporting opening more than uh, 1,600 new continuing care and community care spaces across the province in uh, budget year 21-22. And in addition, there is $154 million over three years in capital support for new continuing care spaces in uh, priority communities uh, based on the, the best aspects of the uh, affordable supportive living initiative or what we were talking about this morning, uh, the, the ASLI program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. And back to Ms. Lovely. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister, for the answer. It's very obvious that our government cares deeply about the well-being of seniors, and that leads me to my next question. What additional supports are being funded in Budget 2021 to keep our vulnerable continuing care residents safe, and can you please explain how they relate to your business plan? Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to the member. Um, so on, on top of the funding that we're talking about today, um, you, you need to know that the government is working to improve and to, to modernize the, the province's continuing care system uh, in the future to ensure that we can continue to adapt and to evolve to, to best meet the, the needs of um, seniors and uh, folks who are vulnerable. Um, and, and because of that, we are reviewing our continuing care legislation as well as doing a review of the facility-based continuing care system. And uh, this is in addition to our priority focus on supporting folks uh, so that they can remain in their homes, remain in their communities, uh, developing new continuing care legislation, reviewing facility-based continuing care, uh, looking at how home care can be improved and investing in continuing care capacity. Those are all part and parcel of our commitment to, to doing everything that we can to ensure that seniors and the, the vulnerable have access to high quality continuing care. And uh, along with uh, continued operating uh, funding, these uh, four initiatives, uh, and just to review again, the, the home care redesign, the development of new legislation, the facility-based continuing care review, and the enhancing of continuing care spaces and capacity, uh, those are all going to support the continued provision of high-quality care and services to uh, folks living uh, with disabilities in, uh, in Alberta. Thank you, Minister Shandro. Uh, Ms. Lovely? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister, for the thoughtful answer. Um, my last question for this segment. While things were deferred by the pandemic, are you still planning on implementing income-tested deductibles for seniors once the pandemic is over? And how will you fit this into future budgets? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the member. No, we are not. Uh, we, re we recognize the impact of COVID-19 uh, and that it's having on our uh, province's seniors to their health, uh, to their well-being, as well as to their financial security. And because of those concerns, uh, government is not introducing income testing to the, um, the... The program is actually called Coverage for Seniors. It's one of our 22 different uh, drug programs that we provide uh, that are, are government-sponsored. And uh, this is... Um, um, so income testing is not reflected in, in Budget 21, and we are committed to maintaining government-sponsored drug coverage for seniors and in, ensuring that they have access to the essential medications that they need. Thank you, Minister. And now to Mr. Rutherford. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I want to say thank you to the Minister uh, for being here today and also for your efforts uh, and leadership uh, during a difficult time. It is no easy task. Uh, to weigh all of the concerns uh, and outcomes that can come from any decision regarding COVID-19. Uh, and it is certainly a delicate balance. So I wanted to say thank you to you and, and to your team as well. Uh, and also uh, on a more personal note, you've always been very uh, open uh, and, and receptive uh, to, uh, to uh, hearing from me and from my constituents uh, as well and making time. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And two things I wanted to highlight as military liaison is uh, the, the funding that Highmark's received uh, in relation to uh, PTSD uh, research, 
uh, as well as a, a program for fostering resiliency, uh, readiness and growth among military members, uh, veterans and public safety personnel. So uh, those efforts are, are well received uh, by those communities. Now, one of the things really important to my constituency and that I hear quite often uh, is around surgical wait times. And I know it's been touched on a few times, uh, but I, I just don't want to uh, uh, walk away from that topic w without making sure that we, we've covered the whole scope of it. And I know it for you know, outcome one in your business plan, uh, there's $4.1 billion. So it, it's a sizable investment uh, in, into uh, the surgical initiative. And I wanted to just make sure that we, we talk more about it broadly in surgical wait times and, and how they're going to be affected by uh, this investment. Uh, expectations are high. And I was wondering if you could just go through what your expectations are on that. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and to the members. So in, in Budget 21, in, in the fiscal year 21-22, we are planning, uh, as, as um, we uh, talked about this morning, uh, 55,000 additional publicly funded surgeries. And that would be on top of the uh, what we were previously expecting, about 290,000 surgeries that would normally be performed uh, to, to address the, uh, the surgical backlog that's caused by the pandemic and get the, uh, the surgical initiative back on track. Um, and it'll help provide uh, folks with even more surgery, scheduled surgeries uh, that uh, will improve their, their quality of, of life. Um, and to, to help achieve this, um, the, the CSFs will, will increase their, their current volumes by the year 23. Um, completing about uh, 90,000 surgeries per year, up from about 40,000 surgeries that they, they conducted last year. And um, um, I, I hope that answers the, the members' uh, questions, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Shandro, and now on to Mr. Rutherford. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I was wondering uh, as well, Minister, can you identify the, the greatest demand for acute surgeries in Alberta? Uh, and, and how will this measure benefit uh, our senior population? I, I know that MLA lovely uh, touched on seniors as well uh, and the importance uh, of seniors to this government uh, and to all of us in our communities. Uh, and so just again, how will the, the measure benefit our senior population across the province? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the member. So yeah, we, an equivalent of, well, these surgical facilities have existed in Alberta since the 90s. And uh, to a great extent, they, they do um, a lot of surgeries where there, there is the greatest demand already. So a, a lot of ophthalmological uh, procedures um, like uh, cataract surgeries are already performed in, uh, in CSFs. Um, so cataract and other ophthalmology surgeries, uh, that's probably the largest volume uh, procedure in, in Alberta. Uh, it's about uh, 20,000 uh, patients uh, right now on the provincial wait list. And so including um, most of them being seniors. Um. Thank you, Minister Chandra, for that answer. Um, and with that, we move back to the NDP caucus, and I believe it, Mr. Shepard. Is Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to the minister, just to set the, set the stage here. Um, I have some questions about aspects of the capital spend, uh, just to clarify with the minister to save both of us time. If I have questions about some of the specific projects listed, uh, will you be willing to answer those, or would you defer those to the Minister of Infrastructure? Uh, we have, we'll, we'll try, I mean, not knowing what the questions are going to be, I'm happy to try my best to answer them. Through you then, Madam Chair. Uh, in February of 2020, the Premier was in Red Deer. He made a public commitment of about $100 million to the redevelopment of the Red Deer Regional Hospital. But I only see just slightly more than half of that budgeted here, about $59 million. Uh, we think both know that's not an adequate amount. So I was wondering if the Minister could clar clarify uh, this reduction in the amount for the Red Deer Hospital. Uh, Minister Shandro? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, the reason for that is that in the next year, there's another $40 million for the, for that project. So everything um, is on track despite the pandemic. I don't know. Is, is there, I don't think, that there, I don't think the last time we got a report from infrastructure that there is any delay. A big part uh, of the, the first step was to, um, we had the, the clinical services plan, which was uh, completed, I think, in 2019. Um, and then we were able to uh, be able to announce in, in February 20, as the uh, the member uh, mentioned in his question, Madam Chair, uh, and then it was uh, us being able to work with AHS throughout 2020, and so we will be able to get this. 
It's what they, they call a business case. That's not to say, because it's called a business case, that they're determining whether or not to proceed with it, but it's for them to be able to de determine the staging and the, uh, the scheduling. For example, when uh, there is a uh, cath lab, a cardiological cath lab, there is uh, some procedures that would first have to, to be moved from that space in, in phase one to, to be able to, to first um, make the space available for the, uh, the back end of phase one for the cath lab to be developed. So the business case is going to help us with the staging and the planning of all the different uh, work that's going to be included in the, in the project. Thank you, Minister, and back to Mr. Thank you, Madam Chair, and th through you, thank you to the Minister for that clarification. We will watch for the follow through on that commitment. I do note that we have a new project in the capital plan this year, the Lacrete Maternity and Community Health Center. Uh, they're getting about four times uh, the, the amount of money this year as the Red Deer Hospital. But looking at the most recent AHS capital submission on their wish list, the Lacrete project is not a priority. It is not on their priority list. Indeed, I have to go to the middle of an appendix on page 26 of a 29-page document to find any mention of that. Now, I know there's a lot of communities who could use some new or redeveloped facilities. Uh, Bassano, White Court, Wainwright, Beaver Large has the oldest hospital in Alberta, I believe. What, uh, what reason was there for prioritizing this particular project in the Crete over all of these others? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Minister Shandro. And thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, a significant amount of work uh, occurred in, in 2019 and in 2020, uh, working with the community of Lacrete, brought to our attention the 280 um, uh, babies that, that uh, might be born in a given year in this growing community, and the, uh, the concerns of um, lack of uh, primary care as well for, for new mothers. Um, uh, a lot of um, probably insufficient services provided their community when it comes to, um, to public health and the opportunities for, for new mothers to understand um, what uh, opportunities there might be for, for vaccinations for a newborn. And uh, so to be able to enhance and uh, fill in the gaps in the community for, for primary care, for public health, as well as for maternity care for the, uh, the community, we had done a significant amount of work for us to be able to um, identify what the options might be uh, for, uh, for Lacrete and being able to move forward. And, um, and in understanding, a, a lot of primary care usually isn't uh, provided uh, by AHS, um, but we uh, did understand the, the difficulties with uh, this remote community and wanting to work with them to improve primary care, maternity care, and, and public health in, the, uh, in that uh, remote community. Thank you, Minister Shandro. Back to Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Remaining time? Uh, five minutes and 15 seconds. Thank you. Regarding the Calgary Cancer Center, now on that, there's about $132 million that was in the 2020 capital plan that does not appear in this one. Now, I heard the infrastructure minister, as his staff said that this is a question of a cash flow. But if these funds are simply being rolled out beyond the scope of this capital plan, then that would suggest there might be some sort of construction delay, but the minister has clearly stated that he insists there is no delay. So I'm just a bit confused, a little concerned that the plan is reducing the province's investment in the project in some way. So can you clarify where that $132 million has gone? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Minister Shandro. Shandro. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, it, was, it was brought forward in, in a previous budget year. Um, so it's still $1.410 billion. It's on track. It's on scope. It's on budget. Uh, nothing has changed other than for some money being brought forward in a previous budget year. But 20, maybe, Madam Chair, if I could uh, clarify, for the budget year 2021 is brought forward, and so that's why for the budget year uh, 21 and 22 uh, there are uh, differences that are accounted for. And uh, I guess as, as the member, I didn't hear the, uh, the Minister of, of Infrastructure's uh, answer, but uh, if it was described as a cash flow consideration, uh, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Thank you. Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to the Minister. Uh, regarding the Calgary Cancer Centre, uh, can you give us a sense of what you expect the incremental increase to AHS operational costs associated with the opening of that centre would be, and are those costs reflected in this year's budget? Or in the out years? 
Thank you, Mr. Shepherd and Minister Shandro. Uh, you know, uh, Madam Chair, I, I suppose I, I could say that we, we don't know this at this time. Uh, it's going to be built into future budgets. Um, uh, sorry, one more second. Was that? that was it? Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shepherd. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, through you, thank you to the Minister. But I would note, Minister, if your intent is to hold a flat budget in the in health for the years to come, which is what you reflect here, I think certainly that's a significant amount of money that you are, need to, you are going to need to find to fund the operations of an entirely new cancer center expanded in the city of Calgary. So uh, are you confident you're going to be able to find the savings with a flat budget to op fully operate the Calgary Cancer Center? Thank you, Minister, or Mr. Shepherd, Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, just for all of us to, to remember that it, uh, finishing the construction will take a period of time. The commission as well, from the time that infrastructure finishes and, and completes the construction uh, and then hands it over to AHS, I'm anticipating it would be at least a year for them to finish um, commission, commissioning and, and moving into to the building. And so I don't think the, the, the building is expected to be open to the public until the year 23. 24. Late, late 23, 24. Thank you, Minister. And back to Mr. Shepherd. Uh, thank you through you to the Minister, uh, Madam Chair. And certainly I appreciate that we are some time out from the operation of that center necessarily. However, the Minister is projecting that he is going to hold a flat budget for health throughout that period and indeed into that then election year. It would be my hope that some consideration is being given to how this will be balanced amongst the many other initiatives that this minister is proposing and for which we have distressingly less information on his objectives, his performance metrics, and other pieces which are going to build into that. And I apologize, I'm imagining at this point we are down to a matter of seconds before we are moving on to that. One minute. Thank you. So. At this point, I don't think I have another question that will necessarily fit into this time. But I will simply observe that with this and with, I guess, indeed, with the situation with Lacrete, there is some concern, again, about a lack of transparency about some of these decisions that are being made that will have a significant impact for some of these communities. And indeed, in terms of the decision to prioritize the Lacrete project, while well, so many other facilities across the province have been waiting for investment indeed at a time when we see people having to fundraise for new washrooms at the Rocky Mountain Hospital, that we see folks having to fundraise for a stretcher at a hospital in Olds Didsbury. It is concerning that we have a new project like this, which suddenly appears it was not prioritized by AHS, but has been determined to be priority by the minister here. But uh, at this time, if the minister, I guess, has anything we will leave it there. Um, thank you for that. Um, I will now pass the floor over to the Government Caucus for the next round of questions, and I believe Mr. Rutherford has another question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Minister, I, I just had one more question on the, the surgical wait times that I wanted to ask before I turn it over. Uh, I was wondering if you could touch on the surgical system in Alberta uh, as a whole and then how this surgical initiative is gonna benefit that system. Uh, and then also, in addition to that, uh, what capital projects have been announced that will lower uh, surgical wait times in healthcare uh, within the province? Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I apologize to, to the member. I'm also just going to uh, respond to the allegations that are made or insinuated by uh, the previous member uh, we, we also have the, the rural revitalization uh, capital plan. This was um, an amount of money that was included in budget 20, uh, as well as in this budget, where for us to invest in 45 of our rural uh, communities. Unfortunately, uh, a previous government um, allowed a lack of investment in, in rural facilities for a significant period of time during their term, and um, in particular investments in, in MDR. Um, in our uh, medical uh, device reprocessing, which really put uh, a lot of our rural patients at risk. This is an opportunity for us to be able to, to make these investments in those rural uh, facilities 
which were unfortunately uh, under previous government were neglected. And uh, but it's something this government is not going to allow to continue, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and then for the the question from uh, Member Rutherford um, about the the capital investments we'll be making uh, related to the Alberta Surgical Initiative. Um, it was uh, something we announced last year, and it's a uh, um, $100 million of investment in, in um, a variety of our uh, operating rooms that uh, are, are owned and operated by AHS. It was including uh, an investments in our um, major urban centers as well as in our, our rural centers. I know Olds was going to be included in that uh, plan as well. Um, I have to admit, uh, I, I may have to... Um, uh, where else was included? Oh. Oh, right. So yeah, there were projects that were planned for Edmonton, uh, Calgary, Edson. Oh, sorry, I mentioned Olds. Olds, I don't think, is included in it, but Grand Prairie, Edson, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and uh, Rocky Mountain House. Um, and it was $120 million. Uh, I apologize, I said $100 million. So $120 million in capital funding over three years to expand the, the capacity and the amount of volume that could be done in those... Um, those are ORs. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And with that, um, we're Mr. Rutherford, do you have another question? Uh, no, I was just going to thank you, Minister, uh, and my time. Thank you. And now we have Ms. Glasgow. Thank you, Madam Chair. And can I get a time check, please? Seven minutes. Thank you. So, um, Minister, I'm referring to page 54 of your business plan um, uh, under the initiative supporting key objectives in your second bullet. Um, I'll just let you get there. It states that 2021-2022, over $41 million is budgeted to support increased access to publicly funded addiction and mental health treatment spaces, including access to five life-changing recovery communities. In my constituency, of course, um, Minister, this is very important, as I spoke about earlier in the estimates today, just um, how this pandemic has really shaped and uh, re reignited the debate um, around um, what we can be doing publicly and within our communities for people who are suff suffering from mental health and addictions issues. Um, so Minister, I know that hearing that there are um, publicly funded addiction beds um, coming to the province, wherever they may be, is really good news. And I think that's something that both sides of the aisle can actually celebrate, Minister. So I was wondering if you could elaborate, um, based on page 54 of the business plan and your key objective number two, um, um, what this $41 million is funding, and does this include the $25 million of capital to construct the recovery communities themselves? Thank you, Ms. Glasgow, and Minister Chandro. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to, to the member. Um, so I'll first say that uh, this, uh, the, the, what the, um, the member is asking about is, is part of the um, economic recovery plan, the, the $25 million that was announced last July. Uh, to support the, the construction of, of these recovery communities, these life-changing recovery communities. About 400 uh, people would be em employed during the, the construction phase. Uh, this is separate from the 21-22 uh, the, uh, budgeted amount of over $41 million. Um, uh, the, the $25 million, that is, is, is separate from the, um, the budget amount of $41 million that the member is asking about which uh, will be the operational dollars that will go to providing then the, the frontline care for folks who are um, seeking recovery from mental health and uh, addiction issues in these uh, communities. Thank you, and Ms. Glasgow. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm very happy to hear that, Minister. It sounds like uh, a great plan, a common sense plan to get people um, into recovery. And so on, on that note, I'm now looking at the fiscal plan um, on page 85, the third line down. In this location, it states that the federal government, as well as providing $24 million by 2022-2023 to combat opioids. Um, and in my community, I can say that, um, in speaking with law enforcement and others, that um, we know that this is a major problem within our communities, even in small communities, um, seeing um, overdoses and... Uh, and so much hardship in these in these communities for people. So can you please expand on how these federal funds are being used to support Albertans with addictions who are using opioids and at a risk and at a risk of unintentional opioid poisoning? Thank you. And to the minister. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the member for the question. So as, as I mentioned, the feds are uh, providing 24 million. Uh, it's 24 million over multiple years to uh, support opioid uh, medication interventions. Um, 
Alberta's government is, is using this money in conjunction with the uh, the previously existing budget and the new $140 million over four years to increase the availability of uh, best practice recovery support medications. So this would include uh, Suboxone and Methadone. Uh, they're, these are um, opioid uh, agonist therapies, uh, commonly referred to as um, uh, OATs, that, uh, that aim to reduce the, uh, the symptoms of withdrawal and the cravings that are associated with entering into recovery from opioid addiction. And uh, the, the medications are, are highly effective um, when they are used in conjunction with the, um, the psychosocial recovery support. Uh, to further support uh, best practices, um, Alberta's government is previously announced the, uh, the OAT gap coverage program to ensure that folks uh, not yet accessing supplemental health benefits can access these medications while they're uh, enrolled in a benefit plan. Um, uh, government is, has also recently expanded the virtual opioid dependency program where folks can, can receive an assessment from a doctor anywhere in the province uh, any day of the week to determine if these medications are right for them. And so as a result uh, of that expansion of the program, uh, wait times for the service has been re reduced to where the, uh, the median wait time for access to care is now zero days. Um, so thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Emily Glasgow. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And finally, Minister, um, a more broad question, but referring to page eight on the strategic plan. Um, so for 2021 through 2024, um, under objective one, delivering cost-effective, sustainable, client-centered health care to all Albertans, um, the number three bullet states that $140 million is uh, allocated to increase access to services, expand programs, establish new fund, uh, publicly funded addiction and mental health treatment spaces, which will support over 4 thousand communities I know are 4,000 Albertans I knew that um, when that was announced minister this had great feedback in my community people were very excited about this so can you please expand um, on how the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions and how our government will be um, supporting Albertans who are trying to change their lives and move out of addiction addiction and into recovery thank you miss Glasgow um, minister uh, just to let you know you've got a minute and 15 seconds all oh, right, thanks, Madam Chair. So, uh, yes, the the 140 million uh, over the mandate is to to increase access uh, to recor recovery oriented mental health and addiction, um, and uh, this year's budget includes a 27 million dollar uh, increase over last year's budget to get us closer to that commitment, and 20 million dollars of that increase in in uh, directly related uh, is directly related to that commitment. The remainder is additional funds that will further the same priorities. Uh, one example from the $27 million increase is the removal of all user fees for residential addiction treatment, uh, budgeted at uh, $5 million. And this change will, will make sure that uh, everybody, regardless of their income, uh, face fewer financial barriers to, to being able to seek treatment for themselves uh, and for a loved one, no longer having to, as occurred uh, under uh, previous government, uh, mortgaging in their house or selling a car to be able to provide this treatment for themselves or a loved one. Thank you. And with that, Ms. Glasgow, there's another 15 seconds. Well, thank you, Minister. I will be resigning my time to Member Gottfried. Fair enough. Um, Emily Gottfried. Well, I guess the bell just rang. So with that, we will move on to our next um, group, which is the NDP caucus and uh, Ms. Sigurdsson. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And it's my pleasure to uh, begin to look at uh, further uh, estimates here in health. I would like to focus also on the opiate crisis here in our province. Uh, just, so it is, it's been a very tough time this past year, of course, as we all know, COVID-19 pandemic in Alberta, an opiate crisis also at the same time. And as I said earlier, we know that 90 people uh, a month have died in Alberta from opiate overdoses and 85 have died from COVID. So certainly it's a, been a very difficult time. Um, we know that uh, because of the pandemic, the border closures have created a situation where street opiate supply has become more lethal. And so there are uh, more deaths in that area. That's one uh, emerging issue that we know uh, is happening because of uh, you know, those two uh, 
issues at once, COVID-19 and uh, the opiate crisis. We know that, uh, just to give us a, sort of a perspective, in 2018, 806, this is according to the surveillance dashboard, um, 806 people died uh, from opiate uh, uh, overdoses. In 2019, that number went down to 627, and then it's only been updated until the end of October 2020, but it's already at that time uh, 904. So we know it's uh, significantly gone up uh, last year. Um, so I'm gonna focus on uh, looking at the business plan first, and I'm looking at page 54, um, outcome three, uh, key objective 3.5, and I just, uh, I guess I want to also uh, echo um, my colleagues' earlier comments about um, that, uh, you know, the mental health and addictions uh, uh, sub-ministry, it doesn't uh, even have a, a single key objective, like the outcome, it has, it only has a single key objective. It used to have a whole outcome before, and so it's really, uh, uh, seems to be you know, uh, less focused for this government, which uh, seems confusing because of some of the things I said in my opening remarks, because the, the issue is becoming more significant. So anyway, this uh, 3.5 says expand access to a range of addiction and mental health services and supports, including through community-based providers. So it's supposed to be expanding access to a range of addiction and mental health services. So can you explain to us what that means? Like when you say expanding, what are you expanding? What other services beyond what is currently available? Thank you, Ms. Sigurdsson. And with that, on to Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and this is exactly what I, I talked about this morning, as well as just in the previous answer I provided to uh, another member of the committee. This is our, our 4,000 new treatment spaces in, in the province, and the fact that uh, under previous government, many people didn't have access to, to these treatment beds, that many people either had to qualify for a treatment space under uh, a government program like uh, Alberta Works, or they had to pay for it out of pocket. So we are expa uh, expanding the availability of treatment spaces, these 4,000 new spaces in the province, to be able to provide publicly funded treatment space for, for Albertans, regardless of their, their income, so that everybody has the same opportunity uh, to, to be able to access this treatment for themselves and, and for a loved one. Um, I'd also say, I, I think there was some um, perhaps incorrect or maybe misunderstanding of um, the folks who are dying, by the way, of uh, the opioid crisis are uh, dying at, at uh, home, Madam Chair, I'd point out. Um, oh, and uh, uh, further, um, going back to the question regarding the expansion of, of treatment, um, I think uh, well, we, uh, we have um, new residential and uplifted treatment spaces uh, in a number of places. Uh, I'll name a few. Fresh Start, I think I mentioned this morning. Sunrise, I also mentioned this morning. The, the Bonneville Indian Métis Rehabilitation Center, uh, the, uh, the Walter A. Slim Thorpe Recovery Center Society, as well as Poundmakers Lodge, uh, for us to be able to provide treatment spaces there and throughout the province and giving access to this type of uh, treatment opportunity for, for all Albertans. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And with that, back to Ms. Sigurdsson. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, certainly uh, the government has uh, introduced uh, more funding for sort of a more recovery focus, and uh, the treatment investment is, of course, needed, and uh, that's, a, that's a good step. But it's, uh, I guess, when we talk about the range, and I thought that that's what the 3.5 uh, key objective was referring to, there's just like a range of services. It's not just all sort of one service, but there's actually a range of services. And we know that there's, in, when we talk about um, tackling addiction issues, we talk about sort of the four pillars. So there's a harm reduction model, there's recovery treatment, there's prevention, and uh, certainly reframing addiction as a health problem rather than a criminal one. And so it's important, absolutely, to have treatment beds, but we know from experts in the field 
Um, like, for example, Professor Elaine Heischka, she talks about uh, these uh, people are dying preventable deaths. Uh, we need to make sure they have compassionate, evidence-based, and uh, build uh, public understanding. Our present response for substance use is oriented around moral judgment, stigma, and criminalization. In the end, success looks like not punishing people for their health conditions and instead connecting them with effective care. And so it is like a continuum. And so when you write range, I'm thinking that maybe you're not talking just about recovery and beds, that you're talking about the whole range. And she goes on to say that whether we like it or not, there are a large population of people who are not willing or able to access recovery treatment, and they shouldn't have to risk death every day because of that. So I guess I, I'm just, uh, you know, when I look at this key objective, that's kind of what I see. I think that, you know, we as a, as a government, as a, as a uh, society would uh, value the range of treatments because we're at different places. People are at different places and uh, we know there's not sort of a, uh, a one-stop way to address addiction. So I certainly uh, would like to pass it over to the Minister, uh, Madam Chair, to respond to that. Thank you, Ms. Sigurdsson. Minister Shandro. I Madam Chair, I, I don't think I, I saw, I heard a question in there, so I'm not sure what uh, I'm expected to, to answer to. Um, I, I think maybe uh, I will then use the opportunity to, to say that um, it has been unfortunate as we uh, made a commitment to Albertans to, to build a recovery-oriented system of care that um, unfortunately we've seen from our, our colleagues in the NDP that uh, there's been criticism because they've somehow seen this as being a zero-sum game that uh, as we, we built up um, recovery opportunities for Albertans that it somehow because of their ideology was taking away from harm reduction which is in the case and the harm reduction um, amounts that are budgeted have not been reduced so there, there's uh, there are pillars and unlike previous government we are not going to ignore one of them which is uh, recovery and recovery options for Albertans and uh, building a recovery oriented system of care is, is not a threat it's not zero sum and uh, we look forward to being able to continue that work with, um, with, uh, um, with, with, uh, with uh, experts and, and, and uh, other folks providing the advice to uh, how we can best provide that recovery-oriented system of care so that uh, we can make sure that uh, this is also an option we can provide to Albertans. Thank you, Minister Thank Shandro. And with that, Ms. Sigurdsson, and there's a minute, 20 seconds. Uh, well, thank you very much. And I guess the question uh, that uh, I was asking is uh, just that there has been a movement away by this government uh, from a harm reduction model. And uh, certainly that's my concern. And it's been more of a focus on recovery. I mean, those words are even being stripped from policy. You know, we're hearing that uh, Alberta Health Services is being told not to use that terminology even. So if I'd love to hear from you right now that you're completely committed to having the range of services from recovery to harm reduction, you know, to prevention. If I, you know, sounds like uh, that's what uh, you're saying, that it's status quo. Yet, yet what we see is that uh, there's been changes in the language and it's focusing on recovery only. So please uh, contradict me, Minister. I'd, I'd like to have your commitment to uh, the harm reduction model, model as well as the others uh, in terms of uh, the treatment for people with addiction issues. Thank you, Ms. Sigurdsson. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Shandro. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I am contradicting the member. That's not true. N none of that is true. And uh, we've not made any... Um, thank you, Minister Shandro. Appreciate that. Um, and with that, we move on to the government side for the next block of time. And I'm just going to give everyone a bit of a warning that we will be going to our five-minute break immediately following um, the questions from MLA Godfried. Great, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you again to the Minister and his team for appearing in front of us today. Uh, Minister, you've been adamant about the, the importance of private uh, patient information, uh, and we see in the business plan that $167 million is being invested in to manage the operating costs of Connect Care, which we've heard lots about, uh, which will allow patients to uh, securely access their health information through the My Health Records portal. So my, my question to you and your team today and, and the incredible uh, 
efforts that you're doing to ensure that Albertans have access to, to their own information is can you explain the advantage Albertans will have with that easier access to their health records and how that's going to help us have a more efficient and more effective system? My health records and oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, member, and, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, uh, so I'd say this. Uh, first of all, there, there are two different uh, questions here. There's, there's my health records, which patients have access to so they can see um, their, their own health records and, uh, and be able to, because it is a right of every patient in the Health Information Act to, uh, to, uh, to be able to also amend, not even access, but also to amend their own private um, health information. And so with my health records empowers folks to better track that, their health and to, to provide a, a secure online location for, for um, to gather, to store, and to, to manage personal health information from a, a computer, a tablet, or a smartphone, and, uh, and later show this information to, to their care providers. Um, and uh, they can view their, their medication history that's uh, dispensed from community pharmacies as well. This includes uh, medications dispensed up to 18 months um, before signing up for My Health Records access. You can also view your immunizations uh, administered in Alberta, uh, which uh, I and my family have, have found useful being able to, to search up and uh, remember when our, our last immunization might have been. Uh, as, uh, and as of February of uh, this year, uh, we have uh, added features so that uh, folks can now also view most of their lab test results through My Health Records as well. Um, further, uh, Albertans can use it to keep journals, they can track their mood, they can track their sleep and weight and their fitness goals, um, uh, upload and, and, and uh, track information from uh, personal health services, including um, uh, supported uh, blood pressure monitors, their, their blood glu glucose meters and uh, fitness trackers. Uh, and folks can also print out uh, reports of My Health Records uh, contents to, uh, to share with their, their healthcare providers. And this is just a start. Uh, more more features are, are going to continue to be added to my health records in the, the months and the years ahead. Thank you, Minister, and Mr. Gottfried. Great, thank you, Minister. It sounds like a great initiative to get us moving into the, the new millennium with new technology. So I'm really very pleased to, to see that and to, to hear that we're moving forward. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that Albertans are going to be uh, somewhat concerned about is is their ability to identify the security measures and protocols that will be in place, uh, not only to ensure that private patient residents are kept secure uh, through their own access, but the inaccessibility to anyone without the proper credentials. Um, so what, what have you done and what are you planning on doing with respect to the security measures to ensure the, the security of that information for the individuals and only the uh, uh, professionals that are, require access to the records? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and, and that's an important point to make. Uh, it's as secure as, as online banking. Um, it's uh, my health records uh, is is designed with uh, with security of uh, private health information as uh, the top priority um, it, for the uh, the product. And, and personal health information uh, found in in uh, my health records is uh, is protected through uh, security practices that are uh, industry standard. Uh, including um, user identification, authentication, encryption, uh, as well as uh, regular activities to um, to seek out proactively and, and find and, and resolve vulnerabilities in uh, on an ongoing basis. So a as secure as online banking. Um, thank you, Minister. And with that, back to MLA Godfried. Um, Emily Godfrey, you've been you're muted. Can we just oh, pause the you. time? Something, a little technical glitch there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you again to the minister for his uh, his answer on the pre previous questions. Uh, I'd like to to move over to to discuss pre prescription drug costs, uh, Minister. Uh, key objective two point three of the business plan on page fifty three outlines the ministry's options. Uh, sorry, initiative to reduce prescription drug costs, which is obviously a, a very noble initiative, but also to increase access to drug treatment options for Albertans. Uh, if you could explain maybe to, to myself and to, to Albertans how the ministry is planning on collaborating with other provinces to reduce costs and increase access, providing a more efficient system for Albertans. Wonderful. Thanks, Mr. Godfrey. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
So through the uh, the PCPA, so this is the uh, the Pan Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, uh, an organization that was set up over ten years ago, I think, by uh, by premiers uh, throughout the country for uh, for us to uh, to be able to work with uh, other jurisdictions to negotiate lower drug prices. Um, and so through the the PCPA, we we try to define those cost savings and to um, to increase the the sustainability of our um, the the twenty two. Uh, public drug plans. Um, those efforts are, um, you know, also providing consistent access to to drugs across the country and uh, to increase access to new drugs. Um, with the uh, the combined negotiating power of the uh, the federal, provincial, and, and territorial uh, governments, the the PCPA um, guesses that its efforts have have uh, saved jurisdictions about 2.58 billion annually. Um, so. Um, a, a big part of our opportunity to to reduce costs and to but also to increase as access, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister yes. Chandro. Um, Mr. Godfrey, do you have another question? No, I'd like to pass my time on to uh, Emily Lovely, I believe. Fantastic, Emily Lovely, you've got the floor. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and um, Minister. Um, at the bottom of page 112, you can see the totals for uh, line item four: drugs and supplemental health benefits. I'll give you a moment to get there. Um, and I, I noticed that this budget item has increased by just over $200 million. Can you explain the rationale behind increasing the drugs and supplemental health benefits budget and by what amount? Thank you, Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to the member for the question. Um, so yeah, budget 21 uh, allocates uh, 1.9 billion in in operating expenses for uh, drugs and, and supplemental health benefits. It, it is, as the member mentioned, a, uh, an increase of 20, 200 million um, from the previous year. Um, the reason is, quite frankly, for uh, the result of, of higher drug costs, um, increased uh, enrollment uh, in in our programs. Those are the the two main drivers in in the increase uh, in costs. In this part of the budget, we just have drugs continuing to cost more, and uh, more and more people uh, enrolling in our 22 um, uh, uh, publicly funded uh, drug plans. Thank you, Miss Lovely, and I believe the next question is going to MLA Newdorf. Happy to do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> I am just pulling up my question. Thank you. Uh, Minister, we know that COVID-19 has impacted Alberta's economy and health spending ha has risen to combat the pandemic and protect the lives and livelihood, livelihoods of Albertans. While Alberta continues to be a leader in health care nationwide, uh, how does the Ministry of Health plan to maintain adequate health outcomes while aligning spending with other provinces? This is uh, just a question from the business plan, page 53. Key objective 2.1. If you could expand on that, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to the member. Um, so the, the McKinnon um, panel report found that our high spending on, on health compared to other provinces hasn't um, led to, to better wait times or to, um, to better patient care. So our, our results do lag behind other jurisdictions. And so to, to best meet the, uh, the health needs of uh, folks throughout the province and to ensure the sustainability of the health system, we, we do have to, to make it more efficient, to, to improve the, the services that Albertans rely on. Um, evidence does show that a, this is something we found in the review, the performance review of AHS, that um, high performing health systems do provide better quality health care, as well as being uh, more cost effective. Part of the work uh, to improve services and efficiencies um, are uh, some of the initiatives coming from the performance review. Um, AHS is, is taking, a, as we've talked about before today, a staged or, or gradual approach to implementing uh, those initiatives, being mindful of the current response to the pandemic. Um, and uh, approved actions will, um, as we spoke about earlier today, uh, result in about $600 million in, in annual savings upon full implementation. Thank you, Minister. That was not a pleasant sound, but the time has now elapsed, and uh, we will be going to 
uh, our five minute break. Um, it is 4.44, so I will say that we need to be back in here promptly at 4.50, please.
that, uh, we will return to today's estimates. Um, and we are at the uh, ND Caucus and Miss Sweet. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks again to the Minister for being here today. Um, it's my first opportunity to be able to ask him questions, so I'm excited about that. Minister, I was hoping we could look at the business plan, please, on page 54, uh, outcome number three. So, ensure a continued effective coordinated response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'd like us to focus on, and maybe if you could help explain uh, to everyone, the process through um, the role of Alberta Health in partnership with, with Occupational Health and Safety, um, as well as the federal departments when it comes to meatpacking plants, and who takes the lead in ensuring the safety of workers in those sites. Thank you, and Minister Shandro. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and first, uh, and, and uh, Member Sweet, I'm, I'm also excited to take your question, so thank you very much. Um, but first, before I do get onto that question, just to answer uh, uh, Member Sigurdsson's question about, um, she again uh, made it sound like there is a diminishing of harm reduction. There is no diminishing of, of anything. Uh, it is merely just adding, adding uh, also recovery to the system. And just to, to highlight this, just on the break, I, I went to the Alberta.ca website and clicked on the uh, the spyglass so you can search and uh, search to opioid. And uh, if you go to uh, opioid response options for care, uh, there's a website there and you can even see harm reductions there. It's on the website. It's even in the same uh, font as uh, treatment options and overdose prevention. You can scroll down and continue to see uh, harm reduction opportunities um, uh, that uh, like the supervised consumption services uh, that continue to be provided and continue to be included in the continuum. Uh, for the, the question about the, the ways in which our ministry works with um, occupational health and safety and other ministries, um, I'm going to impose on uh, ADM, Marathia Mercury to, to come. I, I should say this, we only had Dr. Henshaw for the morning. Dr. Henshaw has, uh, as you can appreciate, a significant amount of work that she has to continue to do, and so wasn't able to stay with us for the afternoon. But uh, ADM, Marathia Mercury, if you could talk about the ways in which your division works with uh, the other ministry, uh, Labour and Immigration, and Occupational Health and Safety with NHS. Make sure that they introduce sure. themselves um, prior to speaking on the record. As you know, Minister, that's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Good afternoon. My name is Trish Marathu Mercury, and I am the Assistant Deputy Minister of Public Health and Compliance. Um, Public Health and Compliance works closely uh, with agriculture and forestry, as well as labour um, around the meat packing plants. There is a uh, a committee uh, formed of ADMs, which I chair, we meet regularly, uh, both internally to discuss what is occurring at those plants. We also have uh, meetings with the operators, um, which are intended to uh, look at best practices, uh, issues that are occurring at the plants, uh, the relationship in some cases with the unions and other operators. So I would say it's quite a, quite a strong uh, uh, operating response uh, to meet packing plants, and, and if you have other questions, we could certainly respond. Thank you. And Ms. Sweet. So thank you for the response. I think I'm looking at if we could get some clarity as well. So at the beginning, when we were first starting to see an increase in infections rates, um, there was a demand on PPEs. And so my question is, is when we're looking at these private providers, such as meat, plant, meat packing plants, and, and we are still seeing some infection rates occurring within those plants, the requirement around PPEs and supporting the workers in those sites, is that a responsibility of Alberta Health, or how does that function work to ensure that they have access to the, the PPEs that they require? Thank you, Ms. Sweet. And Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to the member for the question. So as we uh, worked with AHS two Januarys ago to, to start uh, making sure that we, as a province, had enough personal protective equipment um, throughout uh, for, for the, the response to the pandemic, um, we were, uh, at the time, thinking about mostly the, uh, the, the, the PPE that we required in, in acute care and, and continuing care. We were, thankfully, able to procure 
a significant amount of personal protective equipment in, in general. And, and then through the, uh, the Provincial Operations Centre, POC, which is administered through the, um, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, uh, we are able to, although AHS does the procuring, AHS does purchase the personal protective equipment, uh, masks and gowns and gloves, uh, and, and the multitude of, uh, of other uh, PP that's required in response to the pandemic, there was a distribution through POC um, that from some some of the uh, the PP that was uh, procured by AHS, uh, the details of how POC um, distributed to uh, to the wider community, um, which uh, included uh, congregate living, uh, correctional facilities. Um, it did include as well meat packing plants, but to the extent to which they did distribute to meat packing plants, I would have to defer to uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs to be able to answer that, uh, since it was through through the POC. Thank you, Minister, and Ms. Sweet? Uh, thank you for that, Minister. So I, I appreciate that, that some of this does go through POC. Um, I guess my, just my follow-up in regards to that then is, is given that we continue to see uh, infection rates and, and potential shutdowns of these meatpacking plants, has there been a change in protocol or um, conversations that are happening with Alberta Health to ensure that we can start curving maybe these infection rates? And Minister? So, I mean, appreciating that this isn't a question about budget and about estimates, I, it is uh, still something, um, because COVID is, is obviously top of mind for me, happy to, to answer questions. This is really a, a question for the, the Chief Medical Officer of Health. She's not here with us today, um, but the, the ways in which she does uh, continue to, to work um, to, to be able to um, to provide guidance to to industries and, and to sectors and to workplaces, um, uh, I'm happy to. Perhaps we can offline answer those questions for for the member um, on and how uh, Dr. Henshaw's office is is working with uh, industry on a wider scope, including if it is a question specifically about meatpacking plants, the ways in which she and her office and uh, the medical officers of health uh, throughout HS understanding that most of our MOHs are, are actually employees of AHS and uh, the ways in which those MOHs and, and Dr. Hinshaw are working with meatpacking plants to, uh, to provide them with guidance and uh, ensuring that uh, the, the safety of, of the employees is uh, top of mind. Thank you, Minister Chandro. Ms. Sweet. Uh, yeah, thank you, Minister. Well, since um, I would be very interested in talking to uh, the Chief Medical Officer in regards to sort of the process around that for educational purposes, but let's move on back to opiates. So um, you had made a comment in your, in your last comments to one of my colleagues about the fact that we are actually seeing that many people who are overdosing due to opiate use are actually overdosing at home. So my concern with that is, is that there was a pilot project that was supposed to be started, which was the telephone uh, call line that people could call in when they were going to use uh, in case there was a potential overdose and emergency would immediately be called. That pilot project was cancelled before it even got started. It was the day it was supposed to be started. The minister came out and announced cancellation of it. Can you please explain to me, given the fact that you've commented on people dying at home, why this program would have been cancelled and why it's not being funded under this, this budget? Um, thank you, Ms. Sweet. And while there is a lot of latitude given to uh, during these estimates, I would remind all members to make sure that they are doing their best to make sure that all questions relate to the estimates at hand. But with that, Minister Chandro. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and it is uh, something that um, I, I feel strongly about. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions that are unrelated to estimates as well. Um, but uh, the reason that uh, uh, this program um, was, wasn't cancelled is because it was, um, it was seen very clearly uh, in the evidence to not be uh, effective in other jurisdictions. That's not to say we're not still looking at uh, other initiatives, though, to be able to, um, to, to provide uh, something similar. And, and we anticipate that there will be uh, an announcement related to, to something like that in the, in the near future. Wonderful. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And Ms. Sweet, there's 40 seconds remaining. Great. So going back then to the budget and the fact that um, supervised consumption sites are part of the continuing services through Alberta Health, many, many individuals have questions around whether or not those uh, funding resources are going to continue. Uh, we have seen the closure of Arches. And so the questions that I have to the Minister 
is whether or not the funding guarantee is still there for all the supervised consumption sites across the province. Thank you, and Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, look, I, I'll reiterate the the uh, the contract with Arches uh, was uh, just very briefly, Minister Shandro. Well, I would just say that it was it was related to the the fiscal mismanagement was determined through the uh, the independent uh, third party uh, who reviewed their finances, which was a concern for us, and so that was the reason that uh, Arches um, had their funding pulled from them. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And with that, we return to the Government Caucus and Emily Newdorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, Minister. We were on um, business plan page 33. Uh, key objectives uh, 2.1 was the last question. I will now ask a question about key objective 2.2. We see that the Ministry of Health is committed to reducing red tape, uh, as outlined there. And so my question specifically is, what is the Ministry of Health doing to reduce red tape in Alberta's healthcare system? If you could expand on that uh, key question. I know that's a primary ob uh, objective of ours as a government and uh, the Ministry of Red Tape Reduction has, has put forward ideas, but if you can highlight anything in specific, that would be helpful and I uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Newdorf. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, to the member for the question. So we, we start off by developing and submitting to um, uh, the, the Associate Minister of Red Tape Reduction a multi-year red tape reduction plan. And uh, that, that plan included um, you know, legislation and, and other initiatives. It, uh, it looked at uh, a review of policies and reforms uh, that uh, that are both at the department and at Alberta Health Services. Um, AHS is also expected to complete their their baseline count uh, by by May of this year. Um, we know that the associate minister was was hoping that uh, AHS would have uh, done a baseline count for for his office uh, sooner than that, but uh, we we didn't want AHS to be distracted uh, from the response to the to the pandemic. Um, and so they're they're going to be able to to submit uh, their baseline count in in May of 21, and uh, implement uh, any uh, regulatory reductions that uh, may may result from from that by uh, March of 2023, um, and as also to to ensure the the health and the the safety of, of Albertans, particularly because we're responding to a pandemic, uh, significant reductions in. Uh, regulatory requirements are are challenging, uh, but uh, many of the the initiatives, the the red tape reduction initiatives, uh, reduce uh, red tape and spirit by by making lives of uh, of Albertans better without resulting in a in a regulatory count reduction, um, such as the uh, the COVID nineteen response guidance, which is uh, a very uh, significant effort for for the ministry and uh, Albertans uh, will will see a benefit to uh, to this initiative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister Shandro and Mr. Newdorf. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the minister. Uh, one last question on on uh, just our our business and economic impact, uh, particularly with the Ministry of Health. Uh, we know healthcare is one ministry that has a very high number of women in the workforce as doctors and nurses, therapists and unit clerks and so on in many, many occupations. So the additional funding of, of nearly $1 billion or $900 million, uh, is it anticipated that this high level of funding will continue to support women working uh, and getting back to work in, in the workforce or what are your uh, thoughts and plans on, on that additional funding? Thank you, Minister, and Minister Chandro. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, in, in acute care, in the, uh, the net uh, 2,940 new new positions uh, that I mentioned this morning, as well as the additional uh, funding and supports for new continuing care spaces, um, the, uh, the the continued uh, increases in funding for community care and, and home care. Uh, there's uh, significant uh, amounts of support that are included in Budget 21 for us to to be able to uh, continue to to invest in, in health and in these jobs 
uh, which uh, I, I think the member is, is correct, would, would also um, be able to, to provide um, increased uh, employment opportunities as well for, for women throughout the province in, in all communities for us to be able to um, uh, be able to provide those employment opportunities as well as providing uh, more patient care throughout the province for, for the patients who, uh, who need it. Thank you, Minister Shandro and MLA Newdorf. Excellent. Thank you, Minister, uh, through you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that, that significant investment uh, in our economy and our workforce. Uh, my final question is uh, just going to jump to vaccines. Uh, this government has made it clear that mandatory vaccines will not be introduced by this government administration. However, we see that the ministry has set a target of 95% for children under the age of two to be immunized against various diseases within the ministry's business plan. In 2019, only 79% of children were immunized against diseases such as diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, and 88% were immunized uh, against measles, mumps, rubella, uh, and varicella, I think is how we say that. Business plan, page 54, performance metric 3A. So, uh, from that uh, viewpoint and, and some of those uh, targets from last year, how does the ministry plan to increase the vaccinations in children this year to reach that 95% target? And do you think our government's COVID-19 response to vaccinations will increase immunizations in the province or what do you expect the, the impact to uh, the pandemic will be on this immunization plan? Thank you. Thank you, uh, MLA Newdorf and Minister Chandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, and to the member. So the uh, the influenza um, immunization rate, or sorry, immunization program, I should say, um, started uh, in the province in uh, 2009, 2010, and um, and and so we saw um, in 2021 the uh, the influenza season. Uh, we saw the immunization rate at 35 percent. So since the program started in 09-10, uh, that that 35 percent is the highest immunization rate that's uh, been achieved since the uh, the start of the program. Um, and we we do believe that the the culture and the the awareness around COVID has influenced uh, this increase. Uh, so the the ministry's efforts to increase immunization rates has uh, been focused on, on education, uh, has been focused on choice. It's uh, a collaborative approach rather than a mandatory one on, on the advice of uh, Dr. Henshaw and, uh, and, uh, and others in the ministry, because we want to encourage conversations on and the benefits of immunization while still uh, allowing Albertans to make decisions about their own health. Um, and the, the 2019 and, and 2020 school immunization program uh, was suspended in March of 2020 as a result of schools closing and school nurses being redirected to support the, the response to, to COVID. Uh, school immunization rates will, will likely take approximately uh, one year to return to, to their expected rates. Um, infant and uh, preschool uh, immunization uh, services were not suspended as part of the, the response to the COVID. Uh, immunization rates for, for 2020 will be available in uh, May of, of this year. And uh, the ministry uh, published a 10-year provincial uh, immunization strategy back in 2007, which outlined uh, strategic direction for, for the program and uh, its partners to address barriers to immunization, how we can improve our immunization rates. Uh, there has been a lot of significant changes since 2007 to our approach to immunization as well as to the, the health system uh, in the province as a whole to, to increase our immunization rates. Before COVID, uh, the, the ministry was working to, to develop a new provincial immunization strategy to ensure that the, the new strategy is uh, informed by evidence and is responsive to emerging issues and trends. Uh, a clear understanding of the immunization program's current state is uh, is, is required. Pre uh, pre COVID, uh, the, the ministry was also engaged in an internal immunization program review to determine what was working well, um, looking at the the opportunities for improvement and uh, 
looking at the, the efficiency and the effectiveness to inform recommendations for um, later uh, subsequent strategy and uh, action plan development. Uh, on, in parallel to that, um, AHS Public Health uh, has told us that it plans to review its internal immunization operations to, to take a look at uh, the ways in which they can be better in, in how they organize and, um, and improve their immunization program. Uh, last, I'll say that a part of um, our province's lower immunization rates was a, um, a result of fragmented immunization reporting. Um, and so in an effort to uh, standardize the, the immunization practices and establish um, and established immunization reporting requirements in uh, December of uh, 18, the uh, Alberta government... You can finish your sentence, Minister Shandro. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, the, uh, to introduce requirements for all providers of immunizations, regardless of where, whether a vaccine is provincially funded or not, or privately purchased to, to be able to report. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And with that, uh, Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Minister, I wanted to ask a, a question quickly just about palliative care under outcome one in your business plan of a modernized seamless healthcare system built around the needs of individuals, families, et cetera. And of course, your estimates line 7.5. Uh, a short while ago, you had the announcement in the fall, about $5 million that went to Covenant Health for some work in education around palliative care, and then an additional $14 million that was going to be directed, I guess, according to recommendations from MLA Williams. He's been working on that now for a few months. I reached out to him about a month ago, just inquiring about how that was progressing. I have not heard back. Uh, I was wondering, can you provide an update on the status of MLA Williams' work? Has he provided you with any recommendations as to how to direct that $14 million and uh, what's budgeted in line 7.5? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Um, Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to the, uh, the member for the question. Um, uh, so we, we have been asked by, by uh, Member Williams to, to have an extension as um, you know, the, the response to the, the pandemic has made it difficult for him to, uh, to fulfill his requirement to, to engage with uh, in his consultations and to be able to finish his report, his recommendations to us. Um, so I'm not sure at this time uh, how much more time he's expecting to, to, uh, to request, but uh, we hope that we will get um, his recommendations on the, uh, the remaining $14 million, um, uh, at, uh, at his uh, um, availability so that we can um, allocate the, that remaining $14 million. Um, and uh, we, we hope that that $14 million will, will um, raise awareness of how and when to, to access uh, palliative and, and end-of-life care and, and develop uh, supports for, um, for caregivers and to, for us to be able to shift from uh, hospital to community-based home and uh, hospice care. So we look forward to those recommendations from them. Thank you. And to Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Minister. I appreciate that update. And indeed, we'll be interested to hear about that extension and when Albertans might expect, I guess, to see a report on that work. Along those lines, has MLA Williams reported uh, any, any list at this time of stakeholders with whom he's met? Uh, I do understand that some stakeholders, such as Dying with Dignity, uh, have reached out to both MLA Williams and your office regarding this process and have not received a response. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Um, while I, we have been giving some leniency, I would really ask that you make sure that you tie the questions to either the business plan or the estimates. That is straying very far from the estimates. Um, and Thank as... You wish, Madam Chair, I can withdraw the question. I would prefer and... Thank you. Absolutely. I will move on then to discussion of EMS services. Uh, regarding your uh, government estimates then on line 2.5, page 112, uh, regarding EMS services under ambulance services in the province of Alberta, uh, does this, but you have uh, at times talked about an interest in potentially exploring the uh, privatization, the contracting out of EMS in the province of Alberta. Uh, in this budget, are you making any, I guess, assumptions or planning any of your funding based on pursuing that as an RFP? Uh, thank you, and to Minister Shandro. 
Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And so I do understand from ADM uh, Cabral, who is um, whose division is working with uh, Member Williams, um, that the uh, the report will be delivered to us in June. And I understand that he does have a, a meeting with uh, uh, the organization that uh, the member mentioned. Um, so first of all, uh, a, a point out to to the committee, Madam Chair, that uh, for for ambulance service for EMS services. Um, there are a number of um, contracted uh, entities that, that provide, on behalf of AHS, uh, ambulance services. Um, and, and some of them are municipalities. Um, some of them are, are fire, fire-based or, uh, yeah, I'd say fire-based uh, EMS services that uh, are contracted out. For example, Madam Chair, with your municipality and uh, the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, one of your municipalities, I should say, you have more than one. Um, and uh, Red Deer, uh, there are other communities as well um, who, uh, who have their um, who, who have ambulance services contracted out to them. There are also another of uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head how many different vendors provide the service. Though I, I um, was looking at recently, I, I should say that uh, there, whether or not AHS is is going to uh, to contract or do an RFP to review the contracts that are currently out there, we're not looking this time to expand the, the amounts of, of vendors that provide uh, ambulance services on behalf of AHS uh, to, uh, to our communities. Mr. Shandro, um, as you're very well aware, I'm very well aware about the EMS contracts and how that has been going. Um, Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, then, uh, again, in line 2.5, ambulance services there, could you provide a breakdown on what amounts are included in that funding for STARS, HALO, and HERO air ambulance services? Thank you, um, Mr. Shepard and Mr. Shandro. The floor is yours. Sure. So don't talk about fuel, don't talk about uh, no. think of all funding and problems. We'll just pause the call. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And so I guess if I were to, to look at a uh, previous uh, budget year, um, I'll give general amounts. Uh, the, the STARS contract is, uh, does, it includes a, a contract amount, includes fuel, and includes a grant. Uh, Hero is a is a grant, and, and Halo um, is uh, I think a contracted amount. So uh, generally, um, it depends on, on how, with the volume that the Stars is is providing in a given year, um, as well as whether there's a, a grant in that year for for capital. But uh, I would say about uh, between six and seven million for for Stars, um, depending on the situation. Hero would be a million dollars, I'm assuming. In, in this budget year, because that's um, the funding that they've received previously. Uh, Halo um, completely depends on, on the amount of volume that they, um, since Halo isn't the only provider of um, uh, helicopter EMS in, in um, communities in the southeast of the province, STARS also provides um, a lot of the, uh, the helicopter EMS in uh, those southeastern communities in southern Alberta, uh, in particular because Halo um, may not operate uh, in the evenings and in the nighttime. Uh, as they still look to get accreditation for their night vision goggles. Um, but for the amount uh, of, um, depending on their amount, I suppose it'd be 140 to $170,000 that might be estimated for the HALO uh, amount that's contracted out to them. Minister Shandro and Mr. Shepard, and just to let you know, we've added 15 seconds onto the time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do appreciate that consideration. So, Minister, then, I guess, again, as part of your work and your business plan to deliver cost savings for Albertans and to improve the access to services, a modern, modernized, seamless health care service for all Albertans, you were conducting a review of helicopter EMS services. We're 15 months in on that. Uh, I understand that you were not satisfied with the first response you had. Can you let us know uh, what the status is of the further review that you're conducting uh, in regards to how you would be allocating the amounts in this line? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, I, 
I'm happy to answer questions that aren't related to estimates. Um, uh, so yes, because of, of COVID, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister uh, Cabral's division has uh, been, had a lot of work for us. And so, by the way, just thank you, uh, John, for, for everything you've, you've done over the last year and all. John has, has been involved in the, the review of continuing care as well as the, the redesign of home care. Um, I'm going to get emotional, John. Thank you for everything you've, you've done over the last year. And, and also trying to supplement what was submitted for the, uh, the helicopter EMS uh, review. And, um, and so I expect that uh, John, well, not that I expect, but John does advise me that uh, in the next month, I suppose, that we should get the, uh, the final version uh, from his office on the, uh, the HEMS uh, review. Thank you. And Minister, uh, Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe I have about 30 seconds left. Uh, 45. 45 seconds. Of course, the additional time. Thank you. Um, I would just ask then quickly, Minister, just to, to follow up on MLA Sweet's question, can you just verify then that all SCS uh, supervised consumption services in the province will continue to be funded through the next fiscal year under your budget? Minister Shandro? Yes, I can. I can say that. Um, it, and it, sorry. Sorry, that beep. We still had the extra fifteen seconds, Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, no, they will continue to be funded uh, because of some amounts that carried over into uh, in, into a different year. Um, the the amount uh, may appear as as being less. Um, but it's uh, we are budgeting one point, uh, sorry, fifteen point seven million dollars in operational funding for the the five exist. Oh, thank you, Minister Chandra. Sorry, the time has elapsed. Um, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the minister for being willing to uh, to take my questions today. You know, as MLAs. We uh, have a varied experience, and uh, we get a variety of issues that come across our plate. And uh, I'm not sure that before I, I, I took on this responsibility that I, I understood just how varied that would be. And, uh, you know, I think that one of our primary jobs, Minister, is to, is to really try to help government serve our people, serve our constituents. It's, a, it's the biggest institution in the province and trying to make sure that, that it actually meets the needs of our constituents is, is sometimes a very hard job. But it's when we, when we get it right and when we do it, uh, it's probably the most rewarding thing that I do as an MLA. You know, I can think of, in, in, in related to your portfolio, helping a senior to access the funds to be able to get a, uh, uh, an operation uh, out of province, ha helping a, a young girl and, uh, and a young mother uh, to explore whether or not we could could uh, uh, afford to uh, have a diabetes monitor to monitor their blood sugar levels, uh, 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 you know, through their iPhone, um, and and whether it's uh, or helping a helping a constituent receive age. Uh and when he came into my office, uh, his parents had literally saved him from the streets. He was sitting in my office and he couldn't even communicate. And we were struggling to understand why the government's age program wasn't able to, to help this young man. And to six months later, after having gotten him on age, to see that he's got his life back under control and that he was communicative and that we could just see the government did something that was really special and important because it, it worked in that person's life. Now, I know that, that in your business plan, you have outcome two. It's a safe, uh, and you state that you want to create a safe, person-centered quality health care. It's on page 53 of your business plan. You say that you want a, per a safe, person-centered, health qual uh, quality health system that provides the most effective care for each tax, do tax dollar spent. And uh, that's on page 53 near the bottom of the page. Thank you. Do you see? I'll, I'll get to it in a second here, okay? Um, now, I want to tie this in then. Recently you made an announcement uh, that the Alberta children suffering from spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, may now be eligible to receive funding for gene replacement therapy treatment. 
and that you are working with a pharmaceuticals company to provide interim access to Zolg I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, Zolgensma on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm sure this uh, came as a really welcome news to those families, uh, considering uh, a one-time treatment of Zolgensma uh, costs 2.125 million US dollars. Now, I just remember when, when you made that announcement with me thinking, wow, what a weight off the shoulders of those parents knowing that we were considering this. So, Minister, I guess the question I have for you today is, can you tell us how much money has been allocated in your budget for Zolgensma treatments and what impact this will have on families? And uh, I think that's an important thing to, to, to bring to the attention of the Alberta people right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you uh, to the member for uh, the feedback and the, and the question. Um, I, I think I, I, I think I've been told by the manufacturer that uh, Novartis said uh, the, the G is pronounced as a, a J, but I, I have to say it took me a long time to to say it properly myself. Uh, Zolgensma, uh, the, the the overall impact of uh, Zolgensma treatments on uh, our total drug budget uh, will be relatively small, uh, and and Zolgensma may reduce expenses as well in other areas as uh, those patients are already using therapies at, and um, that are costly and, and other associated health services. So at, at this time, Zolgensma is proceeding through um, a standard review and, and price negotiation process. It's an interim agreement that we have at this time uh, with Novartis until they finish their, their conversations with the PCPA that I mentioned earlier today. And um, the, but I, I would say this, like the, the kids that are at risk of uh, becoming ineligible for the treatment before that process is complete, and that's the concern that's brought to my attention. People were worried that uh, as, as kids um, got up to the second birthday, uh, that there was risk of them no longer being eligible after that second birthday. Um, and so providing access to uh, Zolgensma on, um, in, in the interim uh, to to those kids um, is uh, thankfully a huge relief to the the parents as the as you mentioned the 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 cost of Zolgensma is um, is a high cost and uh, unaffordable for families and so funding from from the government then makes this treatment um, accessible to them before their their child can can lose that eligibility due to age uh, on an interim basis while we wait for the the PCPA to to finish their negotiations with uh, Novartis. Thank you, Minister. Um, Mr. Smith? That's good. Thank you. I'll pass it on to uh, the next. All right. I believe we have Mr. Rutherford next. Uh, thank you, Chair. That is correct. And I just wonder if I can just get a time check, please. Four minutes and eight seconds. Four minutes. Thank you. Uh, Minister, just wondering in your, uh, in your uh, business plans, uh, there, there's a discussion around biosimilars. Uh, I know I, I had folks reach out to uh, my office uh, talking about the, the biologics and the biosimilars. Okay, can you please explain uh, how the bio the biosimilars uh, pertain to budget 2021-22 uh, and uh, your view of them, please? Thank you, Minister. Uh, it, thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to the member for the question. Remembering that every batch of a, of a biologic, uh, even the originator, so if it's an originator biologic, every batch is going to have some variability uh, in that. And so while a biosimilar is, um, is similar, uh, but uh, less expense, expensive version of a, a biologic, its, uh, its similarity is, is within uh, the bounds of, of how the, the difference in, in every batch of a, an originator will also um, occur. And uh, so a biosimilar um, uh, may uh, become available after the, the patent on a biologic uh, expires. And so uh, the opportunity for, for our province in expanding the, the, the biosimilar initiative was to reduce costs while providing patients with the same safe and effective treatment. And the, the first group of patients to, to switch to biosimilars uh, completed their transition in January of this year. Um, additional biosimilars um, have been um, introduced subsequently, and, uh, and more patients will be completing that transition in the, the coming months. Um, we are 
going to to continue to to monitor the process to ensure that uh, patient safety and uh, quality of care is is maintained. As um, you know, we, we want to make sure that the patients understand um, that uh, even if the the name of the manufacturer on on the, uh, the on the vial is changing, that uh, we want them. And I'd say this as well that we did also include uh, an exemption process uh, for for physicians to make an application on behalf of a patient if they thought that. Uh, the, the patient's health would it all be effective adversely by uh, switching to uh, to a biosimilar and they needed to stay on the biologic. We haven't seen um, any, uh, I think we saw quite, oh, sorry, it's, it's the ADM, uh, Chad Mitchell. I think we saw a small number of applications, but uh, none of them, reviewed by by doctors, not by us, um, that none of them were, were required to, to need the exemption, I think. And so- uh, 78 cases and 19 exemptions. Oh, 19 exemptions. Oh, so there were exemptions. So in 78 cases, applications were made, and 19 exemptions were uh, provided by the doctors reviewing those applications. Mr. Rutherford? Uh, thank you for that. And, and I can understand that uh, having never gone through something like that myself, uh, that uh, it, it can be a little scary to, to switch uh, medications for folks. Uh, and so it, it sounds like uh, that the safety uh, is still present, uh, and that uh, with, with the ability to to have it reviewed by by physicians uh, to to stay on the on the original uh, uh, biologic uh, was there as well. Could you talk about uh, how that review happens? Uh, you said I think seventy eight people uh, put in for it, nineteen were approved. Uh, what option there were, what there was, uh, and still is, and how that works, uh, and then. If you could talk about it in terms of the budget and what and what the what the savings uh, turned out to be. Twenty three seconds, Minister. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, maybe perhaps we can pick it up, Emily Rutherford, uh, at the the next round of, of questions. Happy to, to ask these questions because uh, one of one of the most interesting conversations I had uh, as we we developed this initiative was conversations I had with the health minister in BC, who actually was the the first patient in BC to to he switched himself first before anyone else. Um, it was very uh... fantastic. I look forward to hearing the rest of that answer and upcoming segments and with that we move to the ND caucus and Ms. Sigurdsson. Yeah, thank you very much Madam Chair. So I'd like to uh, ask the Minister to turn to page 113, line 5.2 of the government estimates. We know that that uh, line item uh, includes Alberta's opiate response strategy, support for addiction and mental health services and initiatives in responding to valuing mental health report of the Alberta Mental Health Review Committee. And uh, certainly uh, uh, that would include safe consumption sites. And so uh, um, what I'm looking for really is just uh, uh, last year, the government uh, had a review of safe consumption sites. And uh, certainly there was many concerns with the review. Uh, it didn't even uh, allow the merit of safe consumption sites as, harm, as a harm reduction tool to be within the scope of the review. So that seemed uh, you know, a good example of why this uh, review was biased and flawed. And then several people on this uh, uh, committee that was reviewing it were caught spending taxpayers' money inappropriately on prime rib steak dinners, creme brulee, avocado toast. Uh, the co-chair attempted to charge Alberta taxpayers for thousands of kilometers of personal travel. Anyway, I, I know that the minister, uh, I'm sure, was not uh, pleased with that situation, and certainly Minister Luan uh, spoke publicly about that, and he said that uh, there needed to be a review. And so that's what I'd like to know, because we haven't heard anything. Is the review complete? What were the findings? Uh, will you be tabling that report, that review? What have you done to mitigate this situation? so that it doesn't happen again, so that uh, people are held accountable and responsible use of uh, funds is carried out. Thank you, Ms. Sigurdsson, and to Minister Shandro for a response. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So quite a bit to, to unpack there. First of all, uh, efficacy during the, the review of supervised uh, consumption sites uh, was never challenged. That, so that, this is the reason why it wasn't included in a review because there was never a challenge uh, regarding the efficacy of safe con or supervised consumption sites 
um, if it's not being challenged uh, and, and there was a review that was required on, on the community impacts, that's why there's a review on community impacts. And uh, I, I can imagine that the, the member uh, opposite, Madam Chair, would be uh, very upset if, if we were going to do suddenly do a review that was challenging the efficacy of supervised consumption sites, uh, unless she's asking us to do a review of the efficacy of supervised consumption sites. I'm assuming she wouldn't want that to be the case. Um, there were also a lot of uh, allegations regarding uh, the, the expenses of, uh, of, of a panel that was uh, appointed by the associate minister. Um, my understanding is, is that uh, anybody that was offside um, was required to pay back uh, those amounts, have since then paid back those amounts, and uh, understand as well that uh, the associate minister in his office um, have uh, put in some, some further measures themselves on how they they oversee um, the, the the further amounts that might be expensed by uh, a panel that's uh, um, appointed by uh, by that office. Thank you, Minister Shandro and Ms. Sigurdsson. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, will that uh, review be uh, made public so that we can see what it came, what was said? Minister Shandro, um, and before I get to that. Sorry. Sorry. That's not a good sound. Um, uh, I would just remind the member, we are here to discuss the estimates of health, and I would ask that you at least attempt to have your question tied to either the business plan or a line item in the budget. And I did not hear that in the previous round of questions. Um, to Minister Shandro for a response if you should choose. Well, well thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it wasn't really a, a question related to, to estimates, but uh, I understand that uh, there is going to continue to be further review and further work that's being done. And uh, we look forward to being able to get back the recommendations of that panel uh, when they are completed uh, doing their work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sigurdsson. Yes, I mean, I, uh, I look forward to receiving that also. And I had identified, uh, Madam Chair, government estimates, page 113, line 5.2, had to do with safe consumption sites, and I, I felt that was on point. I, I'm going to refer to uh, government estimates again on uh, uh, page 113, line 5.2, and it's about uh, the IOT program, the Injectable Opiate Agonist Therapy Program. And uh, that program is, uh, we understand just recently, is ongoing now, although uh, it was, uh, you know, imminently going to be ending. But it was changed. There was some kind of backtracking uh, by the government. Certainly patients in that program had taken the government to court because uh, that program was ending. And we know that no new patients for the next two years, which is what it's been extended for, have... Uh, been able, there won't be any new uh, patients allowed in that program. So it is kind of uh, restricting it, I would say. It's not going to be an ongoing program. And so even though it's very clearly identified in 5.2, it's even sort of uh, opiate response strategies, it's, it's almost named in that. Um, I guess I'm you know, I guess maybe the minister can explain that a bit. It's kind of confusing. It was going to be canceled. Uh, then the court case came up, and then all of a sudden, oh, no, we're not going to cancel it. We're going to extend it, but we're not going to take new uh, patients. So he's shaking his head. So perhaps he can illuminate uh, what exactly is going on. Uh, minister Shandro, if for a response. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the litigation was unsuccessful because uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the plaintiffs made the same mistake that the members make in Madam Chair. And it's that there's a distinction between the program and the service. Uh, there's, uh, well, and first of all, I'll point out this, that the, the IO pilot project, which was a pilot project, it wasn't fully funded by previous government. So the members' own government did not fully fund this project. It was a pilot project and uh, current government extended the pilot project, not previous government. And there's a distinction to be made between the pilot project and uh, IOT as a, as a therapy and as a service to patients. So the, we've made it very clear that we're not saying that, that IOT as a service wouldn't be provided to patients who need it in the province, 
but uh, that the the one particular program that the the member is referring to um, wasn't going to be extended, will not be extended, but that's not to say that IOT as a service wouldn't be provided to patients in the province that need it. Thank you, Minister Shandro. Um, Ms. Sigurdsson? Okay, thank you very much for that response. Now I'd like to uh, ask the Minister to look at the strategic plan and uh, objective one, this is on page eight, and uh, delivering cost-effective, sustainable, client-centered health care to all Albertans. And it, one of the bullets, uh, second from the bottom, it says, implement the recommendations of the Mental Health and Addiction Advisory Council to increase access to recovery-oriented uh, addiction and mental health services. Well, so, when I was doing sort of the preparing for these uh, estimates today, I tried to find those recommendations because uh, if we're going to be implementing them, like what are those recommendations? So can you tell me about what those recommendations are? Are they public? I certainly couldn't find them. Uh, it would be helpful to know what they are. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Sigurdsson. And with that, back to Minister Shandow for a response. Sure, and, and, and Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy again to, to take questions unrelated to, to estimates, but uh, look, we, um, the, the Council is continuing to, to do their work and uh, to, to build on the, uh, the previous uh, work that's been, been provided. We look forward to them being able to continue to do that work and be able to provide their, their recommendations to us when they are done that work. Just for clarification, um, it, it was very clearly tied to the business plan, and that was a question on the business plan. Ms. Sigurdsson? Well, thank you uh, very much. And uh, yeah, I look forward to finding out about this. And yeah, I was referring actually to the strategic plan. It was similar to um, Member Glasgow. She did the same thing earlier. There was no concern about that. So I think this is completely within order. Um, I'm going to cede my time to uh, uh, MLA Sweet. 25 seconds. 45. 25. 25. And then we'll come back to me again. Yeah. Um, Minister, I'm hoping that real quickly, just to give you a heads up what I'm going to ask you about next time. On page 13, addictions and mental health as well as children's mental health, I want to focus on rural mental health specifically. Um, and the fact that we do see and we do have reports um, indicating that, you know, Canadian farmers are at higher risk of having mental health concerns. And we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> Fantastic. And with that, we go back to the Government Caucus, and Mr. Rutherford has a question. Thank you, uh, Chair and, and Minister. We were just concluding a, a conversation about uh, biologics, biosimilars, uh, and you were answering about uh, the safety of them, uh, the, the budget uh, savings surrounding that switch, uh, and, and also how somebody goes about uh, appealing a decision to stay on a biologic. Uh, if you just finish your thoughts on that, it uh, would be appreciated. Thank you. All right, Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the member for the question. So we, um, we were influenced in uh, the expansion of the biologic um, or it's a biosimilar initiative and in, in what was done in, in BC, uh, some of the processes and some of the decisions as well. Um, and it's so one of the conversations I had, I, I think I was mentioning, was with the, uh, the health minister in, in BC, um, who very, very proudly uh, talks about being um, uh, a patient who uses a biosimilar himself and actually switched himself before other patients in, uh, in the province of, of BC. And he did talk about the, you know, the anxiety that um, patients have um, is, as the, the name on the vial might be different. And um, so we, we do appreciate that. We, it's important for us to be able to work with physicians and uh, and with and, and with patients to to help them understand the uh, the safety and the efficacy of uh, of biosimilars. But we also knew that there there um, is a need for uh, an exemption process. So the exemption process was was mirrored on uh, the process that was uh, done in, in BC because BC physicians already had that, that experience in, in making the, the judgments for, for those applications. It was BC physicians that we had contracted with to, to do the review because they had that experience on um, making those, uh, um, those, those calls. Um, and uh, so the, the application for, um, for is, is done by a physician on behalf of a patient. Um, there are physicians then who review the application, and then I understand that 19 of those applications did proceed so that the patient was permitted to stay on the uh, the originator 
uh, rather than being switched to um, to uh, a biosimilar. Uh, thank you, and Chair, I can turn my time uh, to another member. All right, we will go to Mr. Amory. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Minister Shandro, for, for the time that you've made so far, and I appreciate that it is getting late in the day. But uh, I want to turn your attention a little bit to a discussion that I think uh, we haven't had much about, uh, and that is uh, support for our Indigenous communities. Um, I want to turn your attention to the uh, strategic plan for 2021 through 2024, and in particular, on page 11 under objective six. And there I read that you have a heading partnering with indigenous peoples to pursue opportunities. Under there it says action number one and that states that the goal is to work with the federal government to improve access for indigenous peoples to key services such as education and health care, and advocate for on reserve services for persons with disabilities, addictions, and or mental health issues. Minister, I wanted to give you an opportunity and ask uh, whether you can comment on what the Alberta government's strategy is to ensuring that Indigenous peoples in Alberta are supported in these, role, in these aspects uh, that you mentioned here, and specifically with respect to recovery from addiction uh, services for persons with disabilities and or mental health uh, supports as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amory. Mr. Shan Minister Shadrow. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the, the member for the question. Um, when it comes to the uh, mental wellness as well as, as um, uh, addiction recovery of Indigenous peoples in, um, in Alberta, it's one of our, our top priorities uh, on this file. Um, to date, we've um, provided funding to multiple uh, addiction treatment facilities that provide specialized support for Indigenous peoples. So that uh, includes um, um, operators like uh, Pound Makers Lodge, uh, that's uh, in uh, here in Edmonton. There's also Sunrise Healing Lodge, um, that's a facility that's in in Calgary. And the the bringing the spirit home facility on uh, the Kainai uh, Nation, and uh, so uh, I also say that as as a part of the uh, the, the COVID mental health action plan, um, uh, Alberta's government is also providing direct support to a, a variety of uh, First Nation communities as well through through those grants and the the money that was uh, funded through that action plan, that 53 million. Um, so we can continue to provide in the pandemic and after the pandemic uh, those opportunities for ensuring that um, our Indigenous peoples uh, in Alberta are supported, as the member uh, said, in, um, in, in their recovery from, from addiction. Um, uh, it, and so, yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister. And Mr. Amory? Madam Chair, I wish to cede my remaining time to one of my colleagues. Fair enough. Uh, back to Mr. Rutherford. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in reference, uh, Minister, to the business plan on page 51, uh, the last paragraph states that the government and community partners will expand access to a recovery-oriented, coordinated network of community-based services and supports to achieve improved health, wellness, and quality of life for those uh, with or at risk of alcohol and drug problems or mental health issues. Uh, can you give us some examples of community partners, uh, please, and, and uh, that the government will be partnering with uh, and, and which services will be provided to Albertans? Thank you, Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you to the member uh, for the question. Um, Community-based uh, nonprofits uh, throughout the province um, have been and uh, will continue to be essential to um, recovery and um, a recovery oriented continuum of care that uh, that uh, Alberta's government is expanding. Uh, the these nonprofits um, are extremely effective in, in creating community. Um, they, they build communities of alumni that also can can help in, in the effectiveness of their programs. Um, they keep people connected 
in uh, the, the recovery community. And uh, these, these are all activities that are just essential in a recovery-oriented system. Um, people in, in recovery often benefit from, from others who are also in recovery so that they can reach out, they can uh, stay connected, they can share their, their experiences and support each other to, um, uh, through that community to be able to continue on, on their, their journeys in, in recovery. And so uh, that would be some of the, the, the examples of the ways in which uh, community partners uh, mentioned on, on that page of the business plan uh, can help us by partnering with us to provide those services uh, to, to Albertans. Thank you. And with that, I believe we are going over. Mr. Rutherford, do you have another question? Uh, no. Uh, Mr. You know Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, or, <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Minister, for taking my question. Um, in reference to the ministry's business plan um, on page 54, we have key objective 3.5. And it says, government will expand access to a range of addiction and mental health services and supports, including through community-based providers. Uh, Minister Shandro, can you please elaborate on how community-based providers are essential in uh, providing these high-quality services to Albertans? Thank you, Mr. Smith. And to the floor, it's Mr. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, and thank you to the member for the question. Um, similar to uh, my question or my answer to uh, Emily Rutherford's um, uh, question, these uh, community-based providers are, um, they, they provide a, a backbone to our mental health and uh, addiction care system. Um, these uh, community providers have um, a, a history that's that's long-standing. It's a long-standing history of uh, providing uh, high-quality care to uh, community members who uh, struggle with mental health, uh, who might struggle with uh, addiction issues, um, and uh, nonprofits in Alberta. Um, I mentioned some of these before, uh, previously in in, uh, in the morning and this afternoon, uh, would be examples like uh, Fresh Start. So there's the the Fresh Start uh, Recovery Center um, as well. Sunrise. I'll, I'll mention them again. Sunrise Healing Lodge. Uh, the Thorpe uh, Recovery Center, um, Bringing the Spirit Home uh, in on Kainai, and uh, many other organizations. And they're often made up of uh, folks who uh, themselves are in recovery, uh, folks who, uh, uh, who are in recovery from mental health and addiction issues. Um, thank you, Minister Shandra, for that answer. And with that, we go on to the ND Caucus for another round of questions. And we will go back to Ms. Sweet who had prefaced some of her questions, so Ms. Sweet, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister. Again, I, I would like to, um, if we could focus more directly on primary care, preventative care around mental health, so not necessarily the addiction recovery component, but the actual intervention of mental health services. And I'd like to specifically focus on rural mental health. So there was a recent survey that was done with the University of Guelph, uh, that indicated that 35% of Canadian farmers have depression, 45% have high stress, and 58% of Canadian farmers are classified as having anxiety. So in looking at those numbers and recognizing that farmers are about one-third of the global economy drivers, um, there seems to be a decrease in lack of access to mental health supports for one-on-one -on -one counselling services in rural Alberta, specifically as it relates to farming communities. And so I was hoping that maybe you could help uh, maybe speak a little bit to the supports and services or the programs that you may be looking at in relation to rural mental health and farming. Thank you, Ms. Sweet. And Minister Shandro, you've got the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll start off by, by saying uh, that AHS themselves has um, a, a program that's, that's uh, dedicated to providing mental health supports to, uh, to farmers and, uh, and their families. Um, and uh, I was just consulting with, it's a phone line, for, for them to be able to provide uh, those supports. Um, uh, I was just consulting with uh, ADM uh, Cabral uh, before the, the member was uh, finished her question. We don't have uh, details uh, about that program, but uh, it is a program that AHS provides within the grants that we, we fund for, for to, uh, uh, the, the amounts that we pay to AHS. 
Um, and uh, it's one of the, the, the ways in which we, we provide um, through, through, our, uh, through Budget 21 um, supports for, for um, mental health supports for rural Albertans, and including more particularly because the member was asking about uh, the farming communities for farmers and, uh, and their families. Thank you, Minister. Is he yes, done? Sweet. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Um, so I'm trying to be solution focused here as we move through your budget. And so a, a recommendation that had come out that we had proposed a couple months ago was looking at using Alberta healthcare numbers for five free counseling sessions so that individuals could access counseling services with a healthcare provider uh, that they are able to identify themselves. So it wouldn't be based on a phone call or an online service, but an ability to actually go in person. I would suggest that through our primary care network, some of that already exists through a referral through, from a physician. But of course, being able to expand that program so that Albertans are able to access it in their communities if they don't have access to primary care ne networks would be, I suggest, a, a good option in regards to addressing specifically mental health concerns for rural Albertans. Would that be something that you would be interested or be willing to look at expanding? Um, thank you, Ms. Sweet. Um, Minister Shandro. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I, I'd say this, that a lot of those calls that uh, to the phone line that I mentioned before uh, do end up resulting in, um, in counseling services and referrals. Uh, for, for the type of access that uh, the member is talking about. So there are um, a lot of opportunities for, for people to reach out and uh, have those types of, of services provided right now. Uh, and uh, we're happy to, to be able to continue to, to look at the ways in which, um, I think it's $1.9 billion that we spend uh, as a government on mental health and addiction, and obviously uh, are continuing to encourage the associate minister and his office to and, uh, and those in, in the division of ADM Cabral to be able to, uh, to look at the ways in which we can uh, be more efficient in how we spend the, those dollars. We obviously also want to have a focus on, um, on how our, um, the, the amounts of money that we spend on, on mental health uh, can, can be more preventative, more of a focus on, on prevention, um, as something that uh, uh, ADM Cabral has, has, has taught me about, the ways in which we can invert the pyramid instead of having the, the most amounts spent on the most intensive uh, types of intervention for, um, for folks. And as well, uh, I'm reminded by ADM Cabral that uh, there was the, uh, the $53 million that was uh, funded in, um, in, in, uh, for, for COVID mental health and the, the grants, that we, grants that we provided uh, to, to, uh, to be able to support Albertans throughout the, uh, the pandemic uh, and the, the concerns that... Um, um, that we we knew would would, uh, would result from from the health measures as well as uh, economic concerns for for all Albertans and those in rural Alberta, uh, those in the, the farming community as well that uh, the member is mentioning. So we can continue to provide those mental health supports for uh, for for all Albertans. Thank you, Minister, and back to Ms. Sweet. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister. I mean, I agree with you that if we can look at doing the prevention around mental health, then the likelihood of having people have to attend treatment would be decreased automatically because we would be front-ending people and giving them the mental health supports they need before it, it can increase to addictions and more severe concerns. Again, I would, I would like to, I think, I appreciate you bringing up COVID-19 response because I think we also acknowledge that there's been some significant concerns around mental health with COVID-19. With those grants that were provided through your ministry, do you know how many of them were actually um, provided to rural Alberta and not to organizations within the major uh, cities like Edmonton, Calgary, Red Deer, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat? Anybody else? Fort McMurray. Fort Mac. <laughs> Come on. Oh, look, we're working as a team today. <laughs> Thank you, Miss um, Sweet. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I can speak um, very quickly. I do know that um, some of the rural communities in my riding received some of those grants, um, but to Minister Shandro to give a more fulsome response. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll just uh, go through a, a listing of those who were provided grants uh, under the, uh, the 53 million that we funded for, for COVID mental health. By the way, if you took um, the, the additional mon money that uh, every other province 
uh, all provinces all together funded uh, additionally for mental health as part of their COVID response. And you multiply it, apply it by two, uh, you get the amount that we funded uh, further here in Alberta. And it does include a lot of communities outside of our major urbans. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I point out that uh, Airdrie, Medicine Hat, Stony Plain, Lethbridge, Morinville, Glenavis, Onaway, Okotoks, Lethbridge, Rocky Mountain House, Lacombe, Lacombe, Stetler, Stetler, um, Athabasca, Barhead, High Level, Drumheller, Wabasca, Standoff, Bonneville, Lethbridge, Tasquin, Drayton Valley, Grand Prairie, uh, Camrose, Rocky Mountain House, Red Deer, Lethbridge, Shard, Leduc, Wetaskiwin, Cochrane, Stony Plain, Airdrie again, Red Deer. Um, actually, I don't, is it Chita or Chate? How do you pronounce it? Okay. Um, Bonneville, Androsen, White Court, Cold Lake, Cardston, Fort McMurray, Lethbridge, Camrose again, uh, Sputnow. Foothills, Foothills, Fort McMurray, Fort Mackay, Nordig, that, Grand... Minister, Minister I, I, I appreciate that, but uh, I will save you the embarrassment of continuing to butcher most of the names in rural Alberta. Uh, <laughs> All right, back to the chair. Uh, Minister, thank you, Minister. Just to keep in mind, that was not me that said that, so I'm just putting that out there. Um, so... If we could, and thank you for, for giving that, that information, I think it's important that we recognize that those services are available. From a perspective of being able to support individuals in rural Alberta access, so access those services, have you created anything within your ministry to bring more awareness to those supports and services, <laughs> and maybe to help um, work on the stigma attached to you know asking for help and looking at um, accessing those supports? I do know the Do More Egg. Um, organization which is partnered with many different PCNs and different supports is not actually partnered with Alberta Health Services um, and so it might be an organization that the health services would like to look at in regards to supporting mental health with egg producers. Thank you Ms. Sweet and to you Ms. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So if it's a question about uh, the ways in which we are um, bringing more awareness to, to these uh, programs uh, I'm going to ask uh, ADM John Cabral to, to come introduce himself and to help uh, with the, the answer to that uh, question. Just for the record, we have 30 seconds that remain. John Cabral, ADM Health Service Delivery. Um, as it relates to the question around uh, who are we working with to promote uh, the various programs that have been in place, uh, we have been working with Alberta Health Services, uh, partnering ministries such as uh, Children's Services, uh, as well as uh, Community and Social Services, uh, Seniors and Housing. Uh, we've also been uh, working with contracts through Canadian Meta. Uh, I will just let you finish your thought. Uh, Canadian Mental Health Association and other uh, key stakeholders to uh, bring them up to speed, including uh, associations that represent uh, addiction and mental health uh, organizations. Thank you so much for that. And um, with that, um, our next question goes to Mr. Smith. No, Miss Lovely, apologies. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Minister, I, most of my questions have been focused on seniors uh, because I do have a very large population of seniors in the Camrose constituency, but I also have a lot of young families. We're a multi-generational community where there's uh, parents, grandparents, uh, kids, and, but I also have a lot of families who move to the area because there's some good paying jobs. And um, usually these are younger folks who start their families. In fact, I have a couple of new schools that are being built in my community, I'm happy to say. And so we've got both ends of the spectrum. And um, you, you've talked about your Baba lovingly, and those are always good stories to hear. But you also talk about your kids, which are, are really the sunshine of your life. And, um, you know, children are very important in our in all of our families. And... Um, when something goes wrong with your kids, we have very good health care in our province here. And if uh, someone needs to send their child to a higher level of care, uh, something more serious that needs to be addressed, 
they usually end up at the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. And I, I'm very happy to say that um, I've met with those folks on several occasions. And uh, fortunately, my family never had to use that service. But I'm really glad that when families from my community have to go, that they always have great things to say about the service that's provided there. And, um, you know, I, I do have a, a couple of questions here uh, that are um, revolving around the Stoller Children's Hospital. Um, so in the 2021-2022 capital plan outlines an investment of $7.6 million into the Children's, uh, Stoller Children's Hospital Critical Care Program in Edmonton. In the government estimates on page 113, and I'll give you a second to get there. And um, so that's line item 7.6. Uh, we see almost $30 million investment in children's health supports. And uh, thank you for that. How are you supporting children's health in Alberta? And how does this investment benefit hospitals like the Stollery Children's Hospital? Thank you, Ms. Lovely. Um, the Stollery is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so Minister Chandro, please. Um, love uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the member for the question. Uh, so I have to give uh, kudos again to, to, to John. This is another one of the pro many projects we provided him and his division to work on over the last year. And, um, and so, so thank you to him and his uh, division for, for um, working on, on this. Um, Budget 21 uh, does include uh, $34 million for, for children, uh, health supports to, uh, for us to be able to expand uh, addiction, uh, mental health, and rehabilitation services for children and youth. And so the, uh, the program will support uh, kids, uh, youth, their families uh, pro by providing coordinated access to uh, pediatric mental health and uh, rehabilitation services. Um, Budget 21 uh, also provides $29 million in new funding for, for these programs in 21-22. Uh, um, and the, the community-based program uh, will support uh, kids, uh, youth, and their families by um, uh, having um, these, these services provided with uh, parameters that are, are still being finalized um, for us to, to be able to um, uh, announce later on the spring. Um, this work is still being done. Uh, we want to make sure that it was at least included in Budget 21 so it could be funded, but uh, there's still quite a bit of work for uh, ADM Cabral's uh, office or his uh, division to be able to continue to do that work so we can finalize the parameters of uh, these programs uh, and uh, the ways in which we can um, provide the support to, to kids and their families. Thank you for that, Minister Shandro. And Ms. Lovely, did you have a follow-up question? I do. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, I have a, a youth advisory committee that I've started, and this group of young people has been fantastic about keeping me up to date with their thoughts about uh, going to class and some of them have had to, well they've all had to do online learning and that transition and just how COVID has really impacted them and uh, my group of students fortunately feel that uh, some of them have actually excelled during COVID and the shift in learning uh, but some of them feel that they have been more challenged and they feel that some of the other students in the school are in need of some supports uh, which leads me to my next question, um, which is what other initiatives are being supported under children's health supports? And can the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions identify any mental health supports for children associated with this budget increase? Thank you, and to the Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and to the member for the question. Um, so th these are supports and services that would uh, promote and uh, protect the uh, the mental health and the the well-being of um, of children and, and youth. Uh, we have uh, integrated um, youth service hubs that have been uh, opening across uh, the province since uh, 2017. 
Um, youth hubs provide uh, spaces for, for kids who are between 11 and, and 24 where they can receive support and uh, help them in accessing primary care uh, as well as addiction and, and mental health uh, supports, community supports um, and services. Uh, we, we invested uh, $2.2 million in, um, in 2021 to the, the previous budget year, that is, 2020. 21 to continue supporting the implementation of youth hubs in um, 12 communities across the, the province. And uh, we're currently developing a, a governance structure to oversee that initiative. Uh, the, the 12 communities, uh, just for everybody to note, uh, would be for Saskatchewan, the, uh, the tri-region area, Medicine Hat, um, Enoch Cree Nation, uh, Masquachese, um, Fort McMurray, uh, sorry, Fort McMurray uh, Alexis, uh, Nakoda, um, Drayton Valley, Bonneville, Grand Prairie, and Strathmore. And, and we've allocated uh, $3 million in uh, Budget 21 to support the operation of five or six sites of uh, excellence, as uh, well as seed funding for further development of additional sites. So the ministry is uh, going to continue to, uh, to, to be working um, with an organization that will provide the, the centralized implementation uh, of supports, uh, oversight and administration, uh, and uh, alignment with uh, other youth uh, serving initiatives. And uh, we, we look forward to, to being able to, to figure out these details and announce them soon. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And with that, we move on to our next question. Miss um, Lovely, did you have another one? Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Minister. I appreciate that answer. I, I don't have any more questions at the moment, but uh, I'm happy to cede the rest of my time to another member, as I believe that there are a few more questions that uh, we have on this side. Well, I see Mr. Godfrey up on the screen, so Mr. Godfrey, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, giving us this time. I think we're down to the last few minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but Minister, I just wanted to, to uh, talk a little bit about out-of-province health care and uh, some very modest changes, but some changes. So I wanted to see if you could provide us, you know, with a little bit of detail uh, on that. It's on, uh, on government estimates line uh, 11.2, uh, out-of-province health care services. There's a, a modest increase, but I'd just like you to sort of explain a little bit more about out-of-province health care for us. An increase from 144.8 million to 145 million. Uh, a relatively modest increase, but can you explain the increase in some of the allocation of the dollars for out-of-province health care, uh, just so we can better understand where that allocation is and, and what benefit that is to Albertans? Fantastic. And to the Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So um, the difficulty is that the, the program is uh, demand-driven, and uh, because of that uh, demand-driven nature, it's, it's uh, a little bit hard for us to uh, determine the scope and the uh, the impact uh, of the the program due to uh, the pandemic, but uh, costs are uh, expected to increase slightly. Uh, so the program is uh, affected by uh, medical travel within uh, and outside Canada, um, and uh, it's uh, sensitive to the economic conditions both within Canada and internationally, including exchange rates with the uh, the U.S. dollar. Uh, the slight increase uh, is primarily for um, out-of-province uh, services that are reciprocal uh, as a result of the, the pandemic, uh, international travel restriction. I will just let you finish your sentence, Minister Shandro. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, international travel restrictions, which uh, influence how people travel within Canada instead of to the United States or overseas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And with that, we move on to, I believe, our final block for the ND caucus, and that will go to Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Minister, if we could take a look at under drugs and supplemental health in your estimates, section four, line 4.8. Uh, I see there is a significant reduction uh, on the line for the H benefit from, uh, from the Pardon me. Yes, from the uh, from the 2021 budget to the the 2020-21 budget to the 21-22 estimate. I was wondering if you could uh, just give some clarity uh, as to the reason for the reduction of just under 10 million dollars. And to the minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, so the, uh, the the decrease is r related to um, those who are enrolled in, in the uh, the program, uh, reminding everyone that this is one of our 22 um, government-sponsored uh, programs that uh, that we fund through um, th through uh, Budget 21. Um, there are, there um, is expected to be uh, folks uh, who are enrolled in the program not accessing the same level of services as they did in past years. So. Uh, fewer dental visits, uh, lower volumes of uh, prescription drugs, et cetera, uh, even though the, the enrollee uh, levels um, are increasing year over year, the, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed the, the levels of, uh, of services that folks are, are accessing. And so that's accounted for in, um, in this uh, line item here uh, that the member mentions at 4.8. Thank you, Minister Shandro, and back to Mr. Shepard. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to be clear, Minister, uh, you're, you're basing, I guess, your estimate then on assuming that reductions you saw in last year when the pandemic began are going to continue this year. Thank you. And to Minister Shandro. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Minister. Through you, Madam Chair, if we may move on then, Minister, I know uh, there were some questions earlier uh, regarding vaccinations, and indeed I did hear you make reference to, uh, to uh, the need to, I guess, uh, have as many Albertans as possible access vaccinations, and I apologize at points I do have to multitask a bit, and I apologize if I missed you providing this answer earlier. But in January, your department told the Edmonton Journal you were planning an advertising campaign later this year to encourage Albertans to be vaccinated against COVID-19. I think we all agree that's important. I mean, at that time, it was around 40% of Albertans that were saying they'd prefer to wait or that they would not get it all together. Um, are there, in fact, amounts budgeted in this budget for that education campaign? What line would that be included? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Uh, Minister Shandro for a response. What's under the CPE's budget? So, so would it be included in this then? So my, my understanding that would be included in uh, CPE's budget and, and not included in uh, the ministry's budget here that's presented before the committee. Yes, sir, I'm not familiar with that abbreviation, CPE. Minister, could you provide? Can you, could you provide communications and public engagement? It's uh, uh, it, and it, that, that amount would be funded through Treasury Board of Finance in their ministry. Thank you, Minister. Uh, on that note, given that, I mean, that does fall in line under your business plan, uh, do you know if such a campaign is already underway? We're well into, I guess, the uh, vaccination process with more vaccines coming in, the potential, as Dr. Hinshaw has said, for all adult Albertans to be able to access the vaccine if they want it by the end of June. Uh, do you intend to have this campaign expedited and out soon? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Uh, Minister Shandro. Uh, yes, it is underway, and it will continue to be underway as we continue to uh, make sure that um, we are, are trying to get the, the, the most amount of uptake, as, as they call it, in, in, in vaccine deployment, uh, the most amount of uptake uh, in, of Albertans. In, um, in, and some of it isn't necessarily uh, folks saying they don't want uh, a vaccine. Some of it is um, some, some misunderstandings that there might be in, in the different manufacturers, difference between um, messenger RNA uh, vaccine uh, or vaccine candidates, as opposed to uh, to other types of vaccines, um, and a big part of, of our outreach program is is also going to make sure, or is also going to include that, you know, having having uh, pharmacists, uh, if somebody in the community that we have uh, constant contact with, um, having uh, pharmacists um, included in the vaccine deployment also helps us with our uptake in the province because we have those uh, opportunities for conversations between patients and uh, that community health professional to be able to walk through the, uh, the efficacy and the safety of, uh, of the various vaccines, their manufacturers, the differences, and um, you know, which is the, the right uh, choice for everybody. We, we think that that's also going to help us with our uptake as well. Thank you, Minister Shandro. Mr. Shepard. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, regarding line 15, the COVID-19 pandemic response, the, uh, the amount of 500,000 that is booked for the 2021 budget year, did that amount, does that amount include the dollars that were spent on the AB Trace Together app 
and the subsequent upgrades to that app and updates. And uh, can you give me a total on what has been spent on that app to date? Thank you, Mr. Shepard. And with that, we'll go back to Mr. Minister Shandro. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it was uh, two point zero five million that was uh, spent uh, on uh, that was a uh, contract out to Deloitte as uh, the contractor to help us with the development of the uh, AB Trace Together app. Um, and uh, I, I believe that's the answer to the, the member's question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And. Mr. Thank Chef. you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to the Minister, do you anticipate that there will be any further costs for updates to or maintaining the app? Um, Minister Shandro for a response. Sorry, no, I'm, sorry I'm going to... Uh, it's, uh, it's Quinn Ma, right? Sorry, sorry, Quinn. <laughs> Just want to make sure I didn't mispronounce your name since I'm already uh, slaughtering all the names of uh, our real communities, Madam Chair. Uh, so I'll, I'll have Mr. Ma introduce himself uh, to the, the microphone, Madam Chair. Hi there, I'm Quinn. <laughs> we got to laugh. Hi there, I'm Quinn Ma, Executive Director of Information Management. We are proceeding with some technical upgrades of uh, AP Trace Together that help it more, work more reliably. Um, in the in the background on unlocked phones, it's technology that we've uh, adopted from Australia from a company called VMware, and we do we do plan to incorporate this technology um, in in the future. Thank you, Mr. Ma, Mr. Shepard. Thank you. I appreciate that update. Um, and just to be clear, was that included then in the 2.05 million contract, or are there additional costs for that new technology and upgrade? Uh, Minister Shandro. I'd love the 2.05 into this fiscal year. It, it would be an additional cost and, and included in this uh, fiscal year. On, uh, so it would be a, an additional cost on top of the 2.05 million. And you don't know what that amount would be? Uh, Minister Shandro. But we haven't, we actually haven't suspended yet. Oh, okay. But it's estimated to be about 400. Um, it's, we ha so the invoices are, are, are um, still being received, but we would estimate that it would be about $400,000. Thank you. And would that be directly out of your uh, budget then in the estimates, or is that, again, out of the contingency budget uh, for which you would need to make that request for 2020-21? Uh, Mr. Shepard, I just remind you, through the chair. Yes, through the chair. Um, Minister Shandro. Uh, it's uh, amounts for budget year 21, so it would be included in the uh, the COVID contingency line item. Excellent. Well, certainly my hope then that the Minister of Finance will approve that uh, alongside the other funding that we've spoken of, the surgical initiative, and certainly a number of things, which I guess it's, while we have had this time together today and certainly have, I think, wanted to cover a number of areas, it remains concerning to me that we have such a broad line item with a lack of clarity and indeed booking some significant initiatives for the Ministry of Health that indeed are still awaiting approval from the Minister of Finance. Uh, I think it makes it quite difficult in many respects for Albertans to be able to properly understand what the intentions are for the spending from the Ministry of Health and indeed from this government to properly understand what they intend to apprehend, where they intend to direct these dollars. And while the minister spoke earlier at length about all the opportunities he felt that were present for Albertans, uh, I would note that we as representatives for Albertans, of course, have to cover a fairly wide swath of ground. And certainly what we have seen time and again is that this government is choosing to make it far more difficult for us to do that work whether it's through this budget process, whether it's through the incredibly redacted business plans, which were dictated, I understand, to the minister by Treasury Board and Finance, which indeed in itself is troubling. Um, thank you. With that, um, I appreciate the... Um, and we will go back to the Government Caucus, and I believe um, we've got Mr. Godfrey on the screen. So, Mr. Godfrey, the uh, floor is yours. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I know it's been a long day, Minister and staff, so thank you for all your time and energy to, today to answer all of our questions. We were speaking about out-of-province health care, and I know 
Uh, we've all seen uh, over the years uh, certainly some extraordinary uh, treatments that have been funded uh, by the province for that out-of-province care, particularly where there's some some groundbreaking treatments in, in other jurisdictions. And I think that Albertans are, are grateful for that opportunity as we, uh, we certainly work hard to bring many of those treatments back to this great province. Uh, but we were talking a little bit about the line items and, and the uh, modest increase in, in the budget um, for out-of-province health care. And I just, again, we were, I just wanted to clarify and get some details on that for Albertans and for ourselves here uh, in, in committee, uh, of which services are included uh, in the out-of-province health care that would require Albertans to leave the province to receive that care. You mentioned out of uh, across the country and perhaps even um, uh, out of Canada. Uh, so I, I'm just curious if some of the examples you might have of some of those treatments, again, we've seen some in the news over the years, uh, but is there some that really stand out in your mind uh, where we are funding those for out-of-province care uh, that we're at this time unable to provide to uh, Albertans? Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Godfrey. And with that, I will go to Minister Shandro for a response. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, so just for clarification to uh, my, my previous answer, uh, to Member Shepherd's uh, question regarding that 400,000. Um, I understand that uh, I, I've been corrected by, by Mr. Mon and uh, ADM Newmeyer that that 400,000 actually uh, in Budget 21 will be coming out of Line 15 uh, in, um, in uh, our, our budget as, uh, as the Health Ministry. Uh, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to um, clarify that. Um, and and so and thank you, Madam Chair, to uh, through you to, to the member for the questions about the, uh, the out of uh, country health services um, uh, line item in these increases. We obviously want to to make sure that uh, these expenditures um, include folks who may require um, insured physician and and hospital services uh, while they're they're traveling within and and outside of uh, Canada. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're including folks who, um, who seek services in other provinces when uh, that service might be unavailable in uh, in Alberta. An example of that might be um, infants who uh, who have uh, retinoblastoma, or uh, when they're approved for, and, and so then there's different ways that it can happen. Sometimes the uh, the amounts that are budgeted in this line item are um, something that's pre-approved. If it's pre-approved, it has to go through the out of country health services committee to uh, to receive those services outside of Canada, and uh, those patients typically have um, a rare or unusual disease. Um, and that uh, can increase the um, the cost of procedures for for new and uh, emerging treatments that uh, may not yet be available in in Canada. Uh, and so we um, we will we'll continue to make sure that uh, those uh, patient services, that patient care is available to uh, to Albertans if they're not able to to receive um, that that uh, the care because it might be new and innovative or maybe related to a rare or unusual disease for that they have that access to those emerging treatments um, outside of Canada if it's required. Thank you, Minister Shandro. And Mr. Godfrey, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you, I've got a couple. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, so just to, to clarify on that, Minister, again, um, so some of these are for treatments that cannot be uh, accessed in, in Canada, but also you, you noted that some is for out of province. So. Um, I'm going to assume that that is perhaps for somebody who's traveling, who becomes ill in some way, um, that they would be then covered for at least the insured portion uh, from an Alberta um, health, health Services and Alberta Health uh, coverage perspective. So some of that could actually be uh, for traveling individuals who, through no fault of their own, are, are uh, face uh, some health challenges when they're traveling. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Minister Shandro. Actually, Madam Chair, I'm just going to to confer with uh, ADM Chad Mitchell about this. Chad, I just need to be reminded. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, um, yes, it does include the the um, the amounts that we might pay through a reciprocal agreement with uh, a neighboring province. Uh, for example, um, we, we have reciprocal agreements with uh, Saskatchewan and BC. We have a lot. Uh, thank you. I hesitate to interrupt, but the time 
allotted for the consideration of the ministry's estimates has now concluded. I would like to remind committee members that we are scheduled to meet next on uh, March 10th, 2021 at 9 a.m. to consider the estimates of the Ministry of Education. Um, and I would just ask that everybody um, please uh, vacate this room as soon as humanly possible so that um, they can clean it before the next estimates start at seven. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.